should we uh, start with our first introduction sure yeah so uh, good evening everybody uh, we are holding a simple uh, symposium webinar today on surviving the storm uh, the current uh, situation uh, of COVID-19, which is uh, causing problems to uh, different aspects of ophthalmology. Uh, we have Dr. Richard Packard with us from the UK, who's going to give an introduction about our uh, uh, theme of the webinar today. Dr. Packard, over to you. Thank you very much, um, and welcome to everybody. I've got a little presentation here, so I'll bring that up for you, and I'll talk to it. Uh, I know some of you at, at, in the morning, some of us in the afternoon, and some of you in the evening. So we'll uh, try and take a note of that. Good. Strange. Have you got it now or not? No. Okay, let's try again. Can you just click on screen share once again, please? I have already given uh -huh. you the access though. Is it going? Just select the entire screen and share. Oh. How's that? Is that working? Can you see that? No. I believe you've not clicked on the entire screen. I think you have to select the screen. Yes. You have to select the screen. There's an option of entire screen. You have to click on the screen. Yeah, now we see it. No, that's not what I want to see at all. Yeah, we can see. Just say allow. I don't understand why the file isn't up here. That's okay. I, I think you need to click on it manually. You can just say allow entire screen. Then allow. We can see a screen, uh, yeah. But can you see the, the, the presentation? We yes. can see the presentation. Oh, fine. Okay. Very good. Let's go. So there we are. Right, so we're going to be hopefully surviving the storm and learning how to uh, to deal with this. As you will know, this has been a worldwide pandemic, and we now know that there have been over 3 million cases, 235,000 deaths, maybe more, probably quite a lot more that we don't know about. But the good news is there appear to have been over a million recoveries, so that we, uh, we're getting an idea about what the um, the mortality is. The best way of looking at mortality is actually to look at the confirmed deaths per 100,000, because this is the only figure which is actually reliable. What's surprising is that Germany has one eighth of the mortality than there's Belgium, and there's no explanation for that that we've yet been able to come across. In the UK, the daily increases you can see here up to the end of uh, last month, and we seem to be over the peak. Whether it will remain that way, we'll have to wait and see. At the moment, we've had over 26,000 deaths, very sadly. But as I say, this is not a true instance of infection, only of mortality. In the UK, what has happened to ophthalmology in this time of plague? Well, there's no routine clinical activity. All outpatient clinics have stopped and also surgery, both in the NHS and the private sector. There is emergency surgery for retinal detachment. Intravitreal injections for AMD have continued. There's obviously ocular trauma surgery and some glaucoma surgery. What's interesting is that we've redeployed our trainees to frontline services because they're much nearer to dealing with 
the um, sort of emergencies that you see with COVID than more senior ophthalmologists. So there's no training going on, there's no research going on. Risk stratification of patients is happening, but one of the problems is that many patients are refusing to attend, saying they'd rather be blind than dead. There is some remote consultation via telephone, video link, and WhatsApp. So what's happening to me in the lockdown? It's now 47 days since I left my house to do anything except walk the dogs. I'm editing another book with Lucio Barato, which is taking out a lot of my time, translating some people's idea of English into my idea of English. I'm also decided to write my life story, and I'm now 62,000 words in. And I've been a very good boy, and I've been doing some uh, hoovering and doing some ironing as well. So my halo is very, very tight. This has been going on as well for all of you, I'm sure. Lots of amusing videos and pictures. A lot of it to do with President Trump. No further comment about that. But in my own country, there's been some uh, satire of our politicians as well. And as you know, Boris Johnson has had the uh, the virus. Here we can see him just before he was hospitalized. Then he was admitted to ICU. Is there anything out there that can help? Well, uh, Remdesivir does seem in the US RCT with severe COVID to have had some beneficial effect in terms of shortening the illness and possibly also in terms of lowering mortality. In the last day, the FDA has approved this for treating COVID-19, which must be one of the fastest uh, approvals ever on record. Remote consulting is going to work for anti-segment things, but not uh, for getting up close and personal as we normally do, and obviously not for retinal stuff. There's some new software out there that patients can download, so you can have your home patient plan. And ASCRS and other organizations are putting together strategies so that we can start to reopen uh, life and how we're going to do this after the, uh, the worst has passed and do it in a safe way to protect us, our patients, and so forth. So I'm now going to leave you in the hands of all the experts to find out what they think. You're going to learn about the disaster kit, careers, assets, the finances, and finally, how are we going to get to our new normal? So thank you very much indeed. Anybody hear that? Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So I uh, would like to call upon now Dr. Boris Malugin, who's the director of Fedorov Microsurgery Eye Institute, Moscow, Russia. Uh, and we want to hear some words uh, about COVID-19 and ophthalmology from him now. Dr. Boris, can you hear me? No, he's not there. Oh, I think he's just logged out. Uh, in the meantime, can we have Dr. Arun Sethi uh, introduce the international faculty and give us a little uh, introduction about Arun Odea? Dr. Ahit, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. There yeah. you go. So, Dr. Arun Sethi. We can see your camera. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Arun I think he's using Dr. Weber's. Okay, he's there. Should I give yeah, him the access there? Yeah, yeah, please give him the access there. Yeah, there is. Dr. Arun? Yes, I'm on there. Yeah, you're on air. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all, and thank you for joining us for this webinar called Surviving the Storm. We appreciate you giving us your valuable time and suggestions. The COVID-19 crisis has, is unlike any other. It's affected globally, and it's brought the whole world to a stop. One of the offshoots of this is it's brought the medical practice to a stop, especially ophthalmic practice. So the idea of organizing the webinar today was to actually assess how will we go forward from here. 
there are a lot of views, a lot of ideas, and I'm sure that you'll all be able to give us those in a manner that will be both interesting and entertaining. I would now like to thank the eminent faculty that has agreed to come on board. We start with Professor Richard Picard, the famous ophthalmologist from England, Dr. Boris Mulligan, a good friend and also the head of the Federal Eye Institute, Moscow, Dr. Ehud Asya, who needs no introduction, a leading cataract surgeon of Israel, Dr. Steve Charles, a man known for vitrectomies and retinal surgery and a great teacher globally, who has been kind enough to give us a little bit of his time because of his busy schedule. Having you with us is like having the jewel in the crown, sir. Thank you very much. Then I would like to thank Dr. Guy Kleinman from Israel, who's come all the way and who's actually working with Dr. Arsian in Israel and has agreed to be on our panel. Of course, we have none other than Steve Arshinov from Toronto, Canada, a dear friend who's been traveling to India very often, but probably will now do more webinars. Mr. Dr. Hudson Nakamura joins us for the first time from the famous land of football, Brazil. So he will be followed by Dr. Gerard Chua from Singapore, the only country that they've been able to handle COVID-19 in an efficient manner, apart from a few others. Then we have the eminent stylist, Dr. Arun Guliani from Florida, a man who is known both for his expertise in surgery, his teaching capabilities, and his dress sense. Dr. Gerald Schultz, an old friend, will come in from San Diego, who is also at Loma Linda. And of course, the renowned Dr. Rosenbaum Jean Pierre from Paris in France. We also have them followed by Dr. Shmuel Lewandowski from Israel. And the last module is handled by the eminent Dr. Kathleen McCabe, from Flor again from Sarasota, who's a dear friend and Dr. Pa Barbara Peroloni from Italy. Dr. Barbara is a prolific vitreoretinal surgeon. She's in Milano in the heart of Lombardy district, which has seen the maximum number of deaths of medical uh, personnel in Italy. She has had personal experience. Her husband is an interventional radiologist who's working with COVID patients. She's seen many of her colleagues pass away in this uh, pandemic, and she will bring her personal views onto the thing. I now request Dr. Aditya, to please release the videotape on Arunodaya. The idea is to let you know that we're doing community work and we hope that we all can pull in at some stage of life and do something for the community as highly skilled ophthalmologists. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, I hope you enjoy the video. Arti, can we have the video? <coughs> Thank you. Um, we have Dr. Boris with us now. Yeah, he's there. I think can you give Dr. Boris access? Hi, Arti. Can you hear me? Is Dr. Boris there? He's not there. Okay. So, um, after the introductions, uh, we're going to proceed to the first module. 
the first module, the, the speakers for this module are Dr. Ehud Asya from Israel and Dr. Steve Charles from the United States of America. The first module is titled Preparing for the Disaster Kit and is to be moderated by Dr. Boris uh, when he arrives. And uh, the team leader would be Dr. Guy uh, Kleinman for, from Israel, who's going to be asking all the questions. So uh, I think we can go ahead and have Dr. Ahud uh, with his uh, lecture. Yeah, I would like to, um, let's see, do you see uh, my, video, my um, sharing? Yes, we can. Can you see my slides? No, we don't. We can't see it. Please select the screen and click on share. Okay, I'm see. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, yes. we can. Okay. So, can you see and hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, so I will, I will start with the first presentation, and I was asked uh, to talk about preparing the disaster kit in the perspective of the arterial segment surgeon. I'm uh, from Israel, and uh, as you see in the photo, Unfortunately, what we cannot do today is spend some time with our grandchildren, now with one more. And uh, this is the COVID-19 in Israel. This is our current situation updated about several minutes ago. Altogether, we have 16,000 uh, people which were infected and uh, 9,000 of them were recovered already. Uh, severe cases, 1% on respirator 84, which is uh, not too bad. We are, we are set for, for many thousands and the total death rate is about 2%. But what is more important is what we see here on the right, which is uh, these are the curves. We see how the curve of the currently infected is going down, the numbers of recovery goes up, number of deaths goes down, so we definitely are, are doing pretty well, and uh, it, in, it infects on our activity. Now, so what do we do in terms of uh, opening our clinics and working? Uh, I guess that what I'm going to say now, everybody is doing the same. So I'll just since I'm the first speaker, I will just briefly review it. We all have a face for the patients, face masks uh, and their gloves, uh, the social distance of two meters, no more than 10 persons in one room, uh, checking patient uh, temperature for the patient and everybody who have any kind of, of uh, symptoms uh, would not be allowed to go to the private clinic and only one accompanying person. And for the staff, we are fully uh, uh, fully covered with, uh, uh, with masks and gloves, uh, have daily health statement, take, take temperature, face covers, perspex shields for our machines, lit lamps and desk, clean, clean, clean. So we are, I guess, everybody is doing just the same. So there's not much to say. We are covered, it works well. We know that in our country, there was no single case in which uh, uh, even uh, uh, doctors who treated patients with corona, if they were fully covered, nobody was infected. So it does work. So I guess we cannot do much more unless we will go like this. Uh, but I think we are, we are pretty well uh, prepared for it. What I would like to bring into this discussion is this point. And this is the policy of our uh, um, Ministry of Health, in which I have a lot of criticism about because so far in the last uh, month and a half, we got instructions only for the public service in terms of hospitals and community, which were like anybody anywhere in the world, no elective surgery, limited number of patients in the clinic and two shifts, so there will not be a mix in between one team and the other team. But there was zero, no instructions for any private clinic or ambulatory surgical center. So actually every center could do whatever it likes to do or to whatever they considered uh, to do. So the dilemma was, to see or not to see, to see the patients who allow them to see. On the one end, if we do see patients, if we do continue with surgery, we risk the patient and we risk the staff. And as we know, ophthalmology, about 90% of the cases are elective and the mean age of cataract uh, surgery is about 75 years, which is a very high risk in this pandemic. But on the other end, then the patients are visually impaired. They do need help and we are the health provider, even if we take the risk. We don't know how long this pandemic will continue. And in a way, private medicine actually compensates for what the public uh, service does not provide in this shutdown of, of uh, elective activity. So there is, these are the reasons why to do surgery. And there are also the economical considerations because if you have no income, 
that this is a disaster. We cannot pay the staff, staff of tens of, of families. If the staff is on leave of absence, then they do get some uh, payment of 70% of the basic salary, but then it must be at least one month. You cannot go back to work before that. And the competitors, if they do not close down and if they do continue to do surgery, they may take the patients, the staff, and the surgeons. So this is a big dilemma of what to do. Our decision was that we will follow our art, not the pocket. And we do what we think is right for the patients. We do not consider the economic, and we do follow very closely about uh, the, the, what happens with the pandemic. And we decided that we will open when we feel that the need is exceeds the risk. So just in practice today, in our hospitals, in the public service, they do follow the uh, Ministry of Health instructions and only urgent cases were done so far with very limited clinics, 19, uh, 20, 12 hour shifts, no leave of absence, all the academics and clinical activities, brain ground and lectures were given by Zoom. And now we are starting to gradually go back to work. And in the private institute, and this is my institute, we also followed the health the instructions, even though we were not, uh, we, we could not actually ignore them and do whatever we would like, but we followed the recommendation of the American Academy, ASCRS, and other international authorities. We, so far, we did not do any elective surgery and limited the clinic only for the follow-ups. We did at the clinic the one day, but the one week and one month, the patient could choose between they coming to the clinic or do it by phone. At the beginning, it was about 50-50. Now it's more 90% of the patients prefer to come to the clinic. Last week, we started with the gradual return to the OR and then open the clinics. And then next week, starting tomorrow, uh, we, we do open all the clinics. And they are, we know that the pay, patients are still reluctant to come, but we do open up and go back uh, uh, to work. Maybe it, uh, it's a bit fast, but uh, we, we must do it after a month and a half. So I would like to open to this discussion. Who should be the one who makes the decision? Should it be the, the, the government, the Ministry of Health, or should it be institutional? Should it, do we consider only medical considerations or also economical, social, moral, and so on? And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak here today. It's very comforting to know that the problems we as anterior segments uh, have the dilemmas we have are similar all over uh, globally and uh, we are looking forward to the discussion to this topic um, i would request uh, dr weber of sethi to introduce dr steve charles uh, and in the meantime Arti, if you can get his slides uh, let's talk. uh dr ehud can you please stop sharing the screen yeah I did. Thanks. Hi. We can hear you. Yes. Good morning, good evening. Uh, this is Dr. Weber Soti, and I'm, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Steve Charles, who's the founder of uh, Charles Retina Institute, Memphis, Tennessee, USA. And he's speaking on the posterior segment perspective of preparing the disaster kit. Thank you. Over to Dr. Steve Chums. All right, let me share my screen here. Can everyone see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, well, I was asked to comment a little bit about what I've done during the shutdown, lockdown, and and uh, I I live alone in an apartment, so I instead of going to restaurants, I I've learned to cook, and it's absolutely the lowest possible skill. Uh, so I'm on the diet. If it tastes good, spit it out. Um, so I work out like crazy. I have a, a little guest bedroom at my apartment, so I have a bunch of weightlifting equipment in there. So, but but I don't believe in entertainment, movies, hobbies. I only work. So I've done a lot of engineering. I've got over 100 patents. So I spent a lot of time teaching myself photonics and optical system design and control theory during the time. But clinically, we're seeing about half as many patients. The patients wait in the parking lot with their cell phone. We call them in one at a time for workups. Uh, so although we have a waiting room that will accommodate 190 people, 
at any given moment, there might be eight or 10 in this large waiting room and all separated uh, by well more than uh, two meters. And so they're called in for a workup by the technicians, go back outside, called it again just for OCT and imaging, they'll go back outside, call back in to see this position, and then go back outside and call in if they're getting, for example, an pneumatic retina pexy, a laser, or an injection. We've continued to do all, not just the AMD injections, but the diabetic macular edema injections and the retinal vein occlusions. And of course, we see histoplasmosis here. So injections have continued. Um, it, uh, with respect to surgery, the vo I usually do about 18 vitrectomies a week, uh, maybe 20, uh, and it's down to 10. Uh, so it's non-elective. So vitreous opacities, elective silicone oil removal, things like that are, we're not doing. But obviously, we're going to repair retinal attachments, patients that are blind from vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, even though I recognize that could clear if they're bilaterally blind from diabetes, the vitreous hemorrhage, uh, some trauma cases. Uh, dislocated lens material, if it's causing a pressure increase after someone did cataract surgery before all this started, that sort of thing continues to, to go on. The, uh, I think we know these. Uh, our country has uh, the worst possible leadership at the president level imaginable, uh, and that has influenced our care. It's delayed uh, testing dramatically. It's delayed availability of testing materials of the protective equipment. Uh, it is absolutely horrendous leadership from, from President Trump. We have great people like the CDC that are being held back and like uh, Anthony Fauci at the NIH who are bright and would do the right thing if they would, if it wasn't managed in, in a re-election narcissism mode. So having said that, uh, we know that we all of us are trying to take the same sort of precautions worldwide, I'm sure, as Dr. Packard uh, pointed out, uh, as, as well as uh, our friend from Israel. Uh, they, the reality is that although we take a history and take and uh, take the patient's temperature non-invasively, uh, patients are a uh, transmit virus uh, for at least five days before symptoms. So all of these precautions listed on this slide are, are basically uh, necessary but not sufficient. We know that uh, vaccine, although there's some excitement about the, the Oxford vaccine and and uh, several other companies, uh, uh, Pfizer, et cetera, uh, uh, and some work at Stanford. Uh, and brilliant scientists are working worldwide on vaccines. We just don't know when we'll have one. And it, and with respect to herb immunity, the price to pay with herd immunity is uh, incredible amounts of deaths. And so, in short, we're all doing the best we can, uh, but we're a long way off from figuring this out. Um, and uh, What's interesting in the U.S. Um, is that ophthalmology has led the pack uh, of all the subspecialties in terms of decline in outpatient visits. Uh, so even though people, uh, people do say, as, as one of the speakers said, I'd rather be dead than blind. Yes, uh, that's, that's illustrated in these numbers. Um, what's shocking, if you go back that slide for a minute, is the bottom one, behavioral health. Unfortunately, I work as a volunteer in the domestic violence space. Domestic violence is way up as people are home more uh, and they're desperate about jobs and et cetera. Uh, alcoholism's up, suicide's up. And so I'm shocked that behavioral visits are down uh, because the care is dramatically needed. It's absolutely horrendous. Uh, we all try to prioritize what's the definition of urgent, emergent, uh, emergency, obviously end up the Midas we got to deal with, but we, the vast majority of those get tap and inject in the office as opposed to a vitrectomy. So from a surgical perspective, retinal detachments, number one, obviously an open globe, interocular foreign body. Uh, if you have lens material in the back of the eye and the patient's got a pressure of 40, um, you don't treat that with drops. You got to take the lens material out. Now that the residents aren't operating, we don't see that as much. Uh, patients that have a retinal break from a PVD or other reason um, are going to require laser retina pexy, but that's we do that in the office. Um, laser indirects do not have a perfective shield. That's an issue. <coughs> Sorry. And I've already said that we continue to inject. Macular holes are not as time sensitive. You get good visual recovery months down the line. But it's bilateral. It really affects their, their quality of life. And so I have done some macular holes and a few really bad epimacular membranes. Let's say the other eye is blind or amblyopic. I've done a few of those. 
Well, in terms of office care, everybody wears a mask. I wear an N95 mask at the grocery store, at the pharmacy, and everywhere I go. Um, and I've done that since uh, since early uh, since mid February. Um, everybody in our office wears a mask. We encourage patients to wear the mask. There's some stupid thing that you wouldn't believe it, but a phenomenal number of patients will walk in with the mask around their neck or covering their mouth and not their nose. And I'll say, and I literally scold them like a school teacher. Since I'm an old guy, I can do that. I say, listen, um, you know, I, that it is cover your nose. Come on, put it on. Where's your mask? I left it in the car. We'll go back out and get it. So you literally have to push people to properly utilize the mask. So having a mask in your purse or in your car doesn't do much good. Um, we, although we've been having the patients wait out in the parking lot, as I said, and we call them with the mobile phone, it's now coming into the months when it's very hot and they'll have to have air conditioning. And you know, of course, in other parts of the world, it'd be very cold. And, and, uh, and so that's not a long-term solution. It just gets by. A big problem is childcare. These people that uh, if you only you say, OK, don't bring anybody with you. Well, who's going to watch their two little kids? Um, and and that's the problem. Uh, and, and of course, uh, if their grandparents are elderly, uh, infectivity for the, you know, the grandparents is an issue. With respect to surgery, airway management's a big deal. I, I learned this from our anesthesia team over the last month. They have switched to LMAs for years because it's easier for them than innovation. But LMAs leak. And uh, and there's uh, and they've looked at aerosolization from LMAs and they've gone to endotracheal, endotracheal innovation. So they're doing that a lot more. We have always put an oxygen mask on the patients, but now some of them are recommending oxygen by a nasal cannula. If you put a mask on the patient, don't touch it with your, uh, you know, with your bare hands. Take it off with the glove. Treat it as a contaminated thing. The inside of the mask, nothing could be more contaminated than that. So we've got to very carefully dispose of these masks after use. I always leave a vacuum line under the drape. I've done that forever because what patients say under the drape, I can't breathe. I need more oxygen. They're telling you their CO2s level up. Everybody thinks it's about oxygen, but it's actually about hypercarbia, about CO2 retention. So a vacuum line under the drape is very useful to keep the temperature down as well as keep CO2 from being retained under the drape. So I've done that for 25, 30 years. But it's a big advantage here now. So the vacuum line is under the drape. So when the patient exhales, you're not as likely to spread that material around. We've not knowingly operated on a, a COVID-19 patient, but I'm sure we have without knowing it. Um, we all know about uh, pre-testing before surgery. We're now having to do testing uh, 48 hours before any elective surgery starts, which is this coming week. Uh, one of the big problems with serology is the flood in the market of these non-validated tests, many of which came from China. It's a very major problem. Um, one of the things I should have put on this slide, and it occurred to me at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, is that for years, I've always draped the operating microscope. Cataract surgeons don't. Most vitreoretinal surgeons don't because it saves $12 or something per case to not drape the scope. Nothing gets more contaminated than the bottom surface of the microscope, and it's right over the patient's eye. So I've always draped it. I've done 30,000 vitrectomies, and I've had three endophthalmitis cases, and the last one was 30 years ago. And so I'm a fanatic about endophthalmitis prevention. So it occurred to me that applies here, too. If the patient's exhaling on the bottom of your microscope, wipe it off and after each case and clean the bottom of the microscope. Uh, and obviously this is particularly important since you're not wearing, uh, since, since they don't use covers, most people don't. Just those little sterile knobs on there are not enough and they have nothing to do with the, of course, COVID-19 pre prevention. I think that's all I have in the slides, yes. Um, so I uh, wanna thank uh, Dr. Sethi and the team for putting this together. I uh, hope this was useful. Uh, let me uh, get rid of my screen here and go back to the video. Um, and I'm ready if there are any questions for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that very informative talk. Um, the questions will be uh, following this, by, uh, which will be led by Dr. Kai from Israel. Dr. Kai, can we have his slides for the questions for the speakers? And can you share my slides? Can see where I can share my slides? You have to click on screen share. I think RTU also have his slides. 
No, I don't. Can you share? Okay. Yep. Uh, Just select the screen. No. So I have a few questions for you. Uh, obviously, we are going back to uh, to work a little bit differently. So we have a few questions. And the first one is, uh, what is the preferred or cost-effective methods of checking IOP? Are we going to check every patient that we used to do? Uh, are we going to change our policy? You know, this is the guidelines that the company give us to clean and disinfect the government accommodation kilometer. Uh, I guess most of us are not doing it uh, as we need it here. Can you see the, can you see it? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll take that, I'll, I'll try on that question. Um, I, we've used the Tonopan exclusively uh, which have sterile covers forever. Why? I don't want to get floor seen in the tear film uh, and, and, and make angiograms uh, less useful or judgment of flare less useful. So we've never used uh, applination tonometers. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to add that the sterilization of an application tonometer has a, somewhat of a parallel with the recommended way to sterilize our, our condensing lenses for indirect ophthalmoscopy or the 90 diopter lens. If you use the sterilization technique recommended with the package of those lenses, it destroys the anti-reflective coating literally in one pass if you properly do it. So we have this additional problem of keeping our lenses sterile. And we literally hand carried those with our gloves on to the sink and wash them with soap and water. Okay, what about using Tonopane or Iker? Can I just yeah. add something to that guy? Uh, there's a, one of the units in uh, Northern Ireland have actually set up using eye care, a drive-through IOP facility yes. for their glaucoma patients, which I think is quite an interesting idea. Do you have Can you any... get fries? Can you get chips with that or fries or? <laughs> I think even eye care is uh, quite a reliable tool there. Okay. What what I do uh, uh, personally in most cases I do use uh, the applanation tonometer, but I do not use the fluorescing. Actually, it's even easier to do, and I wipe it very very carefully. Puff tonometer is an option, but puff tonometer actually may even spread more of of uh, the tears. So this is probably not a very good idea, but just uh, a very aggressive cleaning after using. Um, uh, a planetary tonometer without fluorescein, for me, it works very well. What about this uh, single-use cover for the planetary tonometry? Uh, well, I, actually, my, my, my very first paper in ophthalmology was in regard to, uh, to uh, an immediate disinfection uh, of adenovirus. And uh, what I did, I, uh, I actually used, the, you can actually create a cover by uh, using a power film. If you take just a small power film and, and wrap it around the tonometer, you actually create a barrier. You measure the pressure. It's almost the same. You can see very well. And just uh, take it off and throw it away. So it does work. I did not uh, do it in the, the, during this pandemic, but this is an option. Mm -hmm. A very simple way to improvise a cover. So, so there is a commercial uh, uh, product now. If you can go two slides back. Which is another one back, another slide back. Here. So this, uh, there is a commercial uh, product. You can put it on your Goldman tonometry and use it, and then just uh, it's, it's single use. We can use this one, and this can maybe help us because we know that there are some reports about virus in the tear field, and you surely don't want to infect our patient. And what's more, a worry is that some of them were asymptomatic. And you can have someone that is asymptomatic with the virus in his tear film and you don't want to uh, infect the other patients. So let's go to the second question. You can go one slide. Okay. So what about our room? How to disinfect the operating room, theater, in between surgeries? Air conditioning is enough. Air purifier. Uh, I saw a nice uh, a, a idea from a Pavis Dudova from a Czech Republic about how to purify his uh, a waiting area. Any thought about this one? The air condition is enough? 
Well, we have you. a relatively new clinic uh, surgery center, rather, and uh, and it has uh, it was developed for interventional radiology originally, and that actually has very high airflow and and quite good filtration. It's not negative pressure, which would be the best. Uh, but we've not evaluated these uh, air purifiers. One of the other options, and the problem there is that that they really don't. Uh, uh, um, what's the right word? Uh, they really don't. Uh, evacuate the air from the entire room. They're more local where they work. And so I'm very skeptical of that those have much of effect throughout the room. Uh, there's another option and that's these ozone emitters that um, uh, my, uh, Doug Mostel that makes the diamond knives as well has been working on. And I've, I've not evaluated those. And then there's also this idea, uh, at least for innovation of this plastic shield like a glove box with two holes for your arms to do intubation, uh, which is one of the highest risk uh, parts of the procedure if you're going to do general endotracheal anesthesia. Okay. Any comments? Um, yes. I think that uh, we should not be very hysterical about this uh, cleaning and disinfection. I mean, this is endless. We, we can always do better and better, better and better, but it works. We see, we do not see patients being infected uh, with endotomitis. We don't see patients infected with uh, adenovirus or, or influenza or any other disease. So why should it be different for, for this uh, pandemic? Uh, if we cleanse the room, in any case, we use all disposable, we do it in the right way. I think that what we are doing routinely is good enough and we should not be being hysterical and add more and more and more. It's endless. I agree. Okay, let's go to the next question. Okay, do you think we'll do different protocols for open globe injury versus cataract surgery? What will do different? If there's any difference between them. I, I, I don't think I would do anything different. I mean, if it's open globe, it must be operated, period. Even if you take a risk, even if you take any risk, it must be operated, the eye must be closed. I would, uh, uh, in this case, as you show here, I would also remove the cataract if needed. I would do the whole case. This is the case in which you can ignore any other consideration and you do the case. This is not elective, this is urgent. You must do it and you do the, the way the medical uh, uh, system uh, directs it to do. I agree. And I just add the point that historically people have always used general anesthesia, the general endotracheal anesthesia for open globes. But there are papers in the literature. Dean Elliott from Mass Ioneer, who's a big expert in trauma, uh, will tell you that local anesthesia is just fine in these patients. You could do a retrobulbar block if you're very, very careful or you can infiltrate a bit at a time around the muscles if you're afraid of putting pressure on the globe. Uh, so uh, and I'm post in, in uh, penetrating trauma, I'm opposed to exploring posterior to the equator in any case. So you, uh, you close what you see, extend back a little bit, but never go back behind the equator. So the idea that you must trap the muscles and all that stuff that puts pressure on the globe is arcane and, and actually causes more problem than good. And if I can add from my uh, own experience, uh, uh, oftentimes we do these cases under uh, local anesthesia. Subtenant can work very, very nicely and it's very gentle. You don't even do, need to do a peribubble or retro bubble, which is blind. If the eye is closed, if there is no prolapse, if the, if the anterior chamber is, is maintained, then I would uh, easily do subtenant anesthesia and it works very well. Absolutely. And, and you can actually do topical with the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber to repair a corneal laceration. It works nicely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think. Some of us are still using the general anesthesia, especially as, as you mentioned, there is iris prolapse and touching the iris will put more damage or, and, and pain. So what would be the difference in general anesthesia and local anesthesia in, in this period? Are you using now oxygen for every case or maybe we can get rid of this uh, mask or nasal uh, oxygen for the patient when you're doing uh, just uh, local anesthesia in cataract surgery? Try not to touch, not to touch the face. Get rid of this uh, nozzle in a uh, uh, supply of oxygen. I will give a very very general answer, and the answer is in these cases, if it is an urgent case, I will do it the way I do every urgent case. 
I will, I will clean as much as I can. I will try to sterilize everything, but I will do it the way I do any other case. I don't think that uh, this pandemic with a corona, with a virus, should change our practice and we should do anything uh, in a different way. The only thing I'd add to that is that the process of, if someone requires general anesthesia, the process of intubation puts the anesthesia provider at, at risk. And so their, their face mask, their gear, uh, and, and either these plastic shields uh, switching from uh, LMAs to, 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 ET, uh, to intubation, as well as the extubation part, that's important. But in terms of risk to the patient and other people in the room, I agree with you. It's no different. It's only the risk to the person doing the innovation and extubation. Okay. Can you can you what is, what is LMA? What, what is LMA? We, we don't know, to know this. Term. LMA is a, is a molded part that fits inside your mouth that, that uh, it sears up and seals the airway, but it's not in, in the trachea. Oh, okay. Sorry. So last question, any special precautions while syringe a patient with lacrimal duct? Uh, anything that you'll do different using this uh, face shield? Anything different? My, my special oh, precaution yeah. is to call the, 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 the ophthalmic plastic surgeon since I'm a retina guy. <laughs> I don't even know where the duct is. Well, most patients, you would, if they got a bit of a watering eye, you wouldn't be doing it anywhere in this situation. You know, it's completely non-urgent. I think okay. we'll go to the next module. Yeah, I think we'll do this. We're running out of time. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, all the speakers and uh, panelists, for this uh, very informative and very nice session we had right now. Um, can we have Dr. Boris give his introduction, uh, Kuti? And then we can go to the second module. Uh, he's not joined. Okay. I, I, okay. So the second module is about career direction. A lot of us are asking this question uh, about the future and our career. So uh, I'll hand this session over to uh, Dr. Weber Sethi, who's the moderator, and he's going to introduce the speakers for this uh, session and team leaders. Dr. Richard, can you just exit and re-log in? Uh, Dr. Ahab, you too. Just exit and re-log in, please. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Weber. Yes. So oh, the second module was the career direction. Very important because a lot of young ophthalmologists and aspiring ophthalmologists all over the world who are currently thinking what would they be doing in the future because of what happened right now. So I would like to introduce Dr. Steve Arshnoff, who's the associate professor at the University of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And he'll be giving us his take on how to, how to aspiring ophthalmologists, uh, what should they do from now onwards? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, let me just uh, share my screen. I would like to take a rather more positive uh, attitude that we've been hearing so far. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, we can't see your screen. Okay. so. Um, we always hear negative things about pandemics, but let me maybe be a bit humorous or change the attitude a bit. So when I first heard the assignment of this topic, it reminded me that many years ago, in 2002, I was asked to give a lecture to a kindergarten class on what an ophthalmologist was because the school thought that my job was unusual. And so I talked to them, and here you see uh, a child giving me a laser, another one watching, and I talked to them about the toys we have, about kids wearing glasses, about kids wearing patches, and they're never too young to go see an ophthalmologist. And then, you know, along came our pandemic. So the first thing I began to wonder about is what should I do? Well, I wrote, I think, six papers so far. And I thought I would learn to play piano because I never did before. And then after about a week of the pandemic, I decided to call my daughter and wake her up for her birthday with me playing the piano. Not well, but trying. Dr. Ashna, we can't see your slides. You can see it? Uh, it should be shared. It's not shared? No, you'll have to click on start screen share. There's a screen share button on the bottom left. Let me do it again. I thought I was screen sharing the whole time. Um, the screen share button, yes. Now you can select the screen, select the screen and share. 
Yes, okay. Yeah, it's split on entire, yeah, perfect. Sorry, I thought I was screen sharing. Now, are you seeing it? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, this is the first slide that you missed about the kids. Yeah. And then uh, I'll get on to my playing the piano. Not very good. I'll just play you a couple of bars of how bad I was. But at least I tried. Something different to do during a pandemic. She was quite surprised with my daughter teaching music. So then I thought, well, when we hear all these bad things about the pandemic, maybe we should look back. And, you know, there was a really bad pandemic in 1918, and there's a fantastic book by John Barry about what happened then. And uh, during the 1918 H1N1 pandemic, 50 to 100 million people died of, of the disease. And they died mostly because there was no social distancing. People were thrown together. There was a big war effort party in Philadelphia after which people died. There were all kinds of problems. And then when they began to go back to work, there were two echo re-pandemics in 1919 and again in 1920. And if any of you ever think that you're about getting sick, remember that probably the most famous doctor that we all know about in, in the world that really set the pattern for how we teach medicine these days, Sir William Moser died in the 1919 echo pandemic. And he said things to us like, uh, listen to the patient, he's trying to tell you the diagnosis. And the greater the ignorance, the more dogmatism we're exposed to. So don't be too arrogant, but uh, do things carefully. So then the question is really, are, are the times really changing? It is really different because most likely in three years or so, we will have a memory of the pandemic and not much else. Um, so is it changing our practice forever? Well, I think in some respects, it is. this is about my fourth or fifth webinar. And one thing I've learned is in the first one I did, there were more than 3,000 attendees. That never happens at meetings that I go to because the hotels and meeting places aren't big enough. And I think that perhaps in the future, we'll be able to have people logging on to these kinds of webinars, uh, getting PDFs of what we present. It will cost less. You may want to have the presenters get together, but not everybody. And we can have meetings that way. It'll make our local rounds much easier to access and to get information. I always have a problem myself in traveling from my office downtown to where we have rounds because it's a long way and I have an urgent patient or whatever. And having it this way would be much easier. But in some ways it won't change. We'll still have our patients who come to us and want us to manage their problems. And if you've been on a webinar, don't think that you're a TV star. America has enough talent without us. And we just struggle along to do our bit. So what should our young doctors do? Well, the first thing they should do is they should learn everything that they're taught as residents and not just pick one specialty in their first year and learn nothing else. It's important to know about strabismus because, you know, if we see a patient a number of times over their life and we know that when they were 20 they had good stereo, but when they're 55 and have a disease, they haven't gotten that way off the guy. They have something wrong with them. If we don't, don't do refraction, we really can't tell how well our patients can see. What happened? And we may see a patient who had uh, they were tired. And if it wasn't very well done, the well, eye may not look very good because of the poor fascia lattice that we get from the eye before we look again. We should learn to recognize those and look at them. We should learn that probably the biggest cause of dry eye is loss of elasticity of the eyelids. And we should learn to recognize that and not look for other sort of not really relevant problems. And we should know enough about ophthalmology to be able to find the fundamental primary cause wherever the patients come to us. Our young colleagues should not think, well, if I just learn to do anti-VEGF injections, I can make a good living and do nothing else. Because the dominant specialties in ophthalmology change over time. That's problems get solved. And from 1980 until 1995, everybody wanted to be a cataract surgeon. In 1995, everyone wanted to be a retina surgeon. In 2005, they all wanted to do medical retina. And now it's 2020, Goes on, we wonder will the next specialty be cornea, glaucoma, or whatever, because things keep changing. And like making cars, making cars was a big deal in time with Henry Ford, but when computers came along, the relative value of cars goes down as the newest thing needs to suck up its share of the economy. And then as you lose skill and you give things up and you go along in your career, remember that every skill that you give up, you give up for your life, and you will not be able to go back and do retina or plastics afterwards if you find that your specialty that you chose is no longer as popular. 
But there are some good things. Well, there will always be cataracts, and so we can congratulate ourselves when we're graduating if we're just a young resident. Because cataracts have been found to be approachinopathy, which means it's due to misfolding of the crystallines in the lens. And once they start to misfold, like Jakob Kristol disease, it's a progressive change, and we can't stop it. So we'll always have cataracts. But the technology will make it progressively easier and quicker to the surgery, and surgeons will have to adapt to better techniques and newer ones. It will take less time, and most likely over time, the reimbursements will go down as it becomes easier for the surgeon to do his part in the surgery. So what should a young person look at? Well, look at big problems to solve. They take longer and may last a much longer part of your career. Glaucoma MIGS has been going on now for almost 20 years, and it's still nowhere near a solution. Uh, and that's a good problem to work on. We're now looking for a genetic method to do gene transfers for all kinds of genetic diseases. That's a good field to look at, because that will take a long, long time before it's totally solved. And now that we have a pandemic to remind us that, well, maybe infectious disease is a good problem to look at. We're trying to uh, solve the problems of endophthalmitis and lots of corneal diseases, resistance to antibiotics, and numerous problems in that. So that's another thing we can look at. Basically, we have to learn to do everything and then pick something to be very good at. My advice is that when you're an ophthalmologist, you can know how to do everything, but have something that you're really interested in that makes you interested and want to keep practicing and doing more things. Because when a patient walks in the door, you have to be able to select what they actually have and not just say, well, it doesn't fit into my small bailiwick. But I think generally, generally things are positive. COVID-19 is not the end. Uh, it doesn't stop you from reading or learning or doing something else during the time that we're locked down. And like the Blue Nose, which was thought to be an end of the line sailboat when Nova Scotia decided to stick with wooden boats and not go into fiberglass, it turned out to be the dominant sailing yacht for many, many years around the world and still is used for tourists and things that has a large, uh, very good longevity. So like with the great influenza, COVID-19 will end and we have to plan for a rewarding bright future and make sure we remain educated and interested in doing more things. Thank you very much. I thank you for inviting me to take part. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, sir. I would now request Dr. Weber to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Hudson. Yes, uh, Dr. Hudson Nakamura. Hi, good to talk to you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to share my screen right now at the moment. Please. Sorry, let me try to share it again now. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, surviving the storm COVID-19 report in Brazil here, and uh, I, want thank, I want to thank everybody, especially Dr. Uh, Aron, Dr. Arshinov, uh, whom I, I had the opportunity to uh, visit him uh, during cataract surgeries in Toronto, where I did my retinal fellowship there years ago. And uh, also Steve Charles and the retinal people here, and everybody, and thank you for the audience. And uh, we are at the uh, iBank Foundation of Goiás, Brazil. And uh, this is our flag. This is Rio de Janeiro, you know, our most beautiful city uh, in Brazil. Uh, at least we consider that. And uh, this is Maracanã. Maracanã is a stadium. Uh, and now uh, the stadium is actually seen and receiving uh, a COVID patients. Uh, many stadiums in Brazil are doing that and many institutions. And uh, we have to do that because uh, uh, anyway, we, got, we have the structure, we got to help. 
And uh, this is my family. This uh, on the left, top left is my son uh, Pedro Lorenzo. Uh, and top and bottom left is uh, Daniel, one year and a half. And uh, this is me uh, before Daniel was born. And uh, I play judo. And uh, I think they like this is Julia, my wife. And this is the iBank Foundation in Brazil. The city of Goiânia is our, it's our city. It's a huge city. 1.6 million people live here. And uh, this is uh, from downtown, down below. And uh, we have in Brazil uh, almost, uh, you know, 85,000 confirmed cases. This is data from two days ago. And uh, uh, today, more than 6,000 people already died. And uh, the lethality rate is uh, quite high, 6.9%. And uh, the rate of infection and death raised in Brazil. Uh, this is uh, info from our health minister. And in 24 hours, two days ago, we had 436 deaths. And uh, we think that's due to subnotification. And uh, in uh, uh, April 28, according to John Hopkins, we were classified at, as the 10th uh, in the world, sur surpassing China in confirmed cases. So our cases are uh, getting quite high. These are official cases, very updated. Uh, and uh, in one day, we could uh, get over 7,000 uh, and uh, 43,000 patients be followed. But 42% of the infected patients uh, have been recovered. That's a good thing, uh, good news. And uh, uh, 1,500 uh, deaths are still under investigation. We don't quite know whether this is from COVID or any other uh, H1N1 or whatever else. And uh, our total number of deaths, it's uh, from two days ago, uh, it's uh, almost 6,000. But today we have more than 6,000, 6,000 than uh, 100 approximately. All Brazilian states with four deaths due to coronavirus, but Sao Paulo has the most. 28,000 over uh, uh, infected patients and uh, over 2,000 uh, uh, deaths. And Rio de Janeiro is the second. Uh, and Tocantins is the state that has uh, the least number of cases. And uh, the, the number is increasing every day. But uh, we are getting to the uh, winter now. And uh, I particularly live in uh, near Brasilia, the capital, so uh, the weather is still okay. And uh, many people are getting infected. The male and the female rate is uh, quite the same. And the most of the cases are hospitalized for uh, respiratory distress and problems are SARS. We have uh, performed some uh, vitrectomies. I particularly perform inverted vitrectomy. And then we have this case of retinal detachment. Uh, I saw this case uh, some time ago, uh, two weeks ago, and uh, we referred the patient to a vitrectomy and they, that's post operative period number one, the patient was attached. So we have to take care of these patients. We cannot only uh, leave them alone. And uh, we, know, uh, we don't know yet whatever, uh, the range of COVID-19 could uh, get to our patients, uh, but uh, we know that at least the red eye and conjunctivitis, uh, we we use it used to see them with this. Uh, it, that's from Pi Magazine, and uh, this is a report we made uh, with uh, Dr. Wai Chin Lam from uh, uh, Hong Kong. He was in Toronto some years ago, and uh, also Dr. Arun, and uh, we. Uh, we have less patients to see now, down nearly 60% uh, in the surgeries uh, as I compare with uh, what uh, Dr. Steve Charles is doing. We are doing far less surgeries, but we're still doing uh, detachment uh, with trachomies, but uh, in some cases of uh, long-standing uh, macular tractions that we have to do because the, the retina cannot wait. And uh, uh, the elective surgeries uh, such as cataract and the uh, procedures such as laser, they are not being performed that much unless we have uh, glaucoma patients, for example, that have this uh, high pressure 
or malignant glaucoma. And so we have to refer them to the uh, OR and uh, they cannot wait as well. So we are doing our best. And uh, I have a video to show you, a small, a short one, on uh, what we do at the iBank Foundation with the vitrectomy. Let me get it in the screen here. Yeah, so we are doing a lot of these uh, Zoom meetings and uh, we organized this meeting. This is a, a red, uh, uh, internal limiting membrane deal for a macular hole surgery. Of course, this is an elective procedure, but uh, we got an OCT and uh, we, we saw that uh, the patient couldn't wait too much until this uh, crisis could uh, be over. Otherwise, he would uh, probably get blind. So uh, the outcome wouldn't be as good. So we have to take care of these patients and uh, do our best, as I said. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jared uh, Chuha from Singapore. We're going to talk about uh, young ophthalmologists and their career. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Arum and uh, Dr. Aditya, for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can. Okay. We can. Well, I'm wearing a red t shirt because uh, Singapore, we are basically Doscon red. As you are aware, DOSCON is uh, the disease uh, outbreak response system. But in Singapore, we call it the circuit breaker. And I'm very flattered that you called us uh, young ophthalmologists. I graduated in 1988, 56 years old. I did my vitro retinal fellowship with uh, Prof. Robert Deveni in Toronto. And uh, I've done uh, 3,000 vitrectomies, 23,000 cataracts. I don't know how many lasers, but it's flattering. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we are from in sunny Singapore. Could I have my slides, please? I don't. I can't see the slides. Just a second, just a second. Okay, sure, no worries. Well, I have a picture here of myself spearfishing and uh, shooting a very big sea bass. I am a free diver and a spear fisherman. So, I have a boat, and my boat is in Indonesia. So, I go spear fishing every weekend whenever I can. Okay, great. All right, so I think we can go down the slide. <clears throat> um, okay, let's start. So the Singapore, we've had about 17,000 uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, this is not the first pandemic that I've been through in Singapore. Um, I went through the 2003 SARS, I went through the 2009 H1N1, and uh, for us, we are quite used to this. I still have my N95 mask from uh, 2003, and uh, we still have a large stash of all the masks. We still have all our personal protective equipment. Uh, the total number of deaths so far has only been 16 which is uh, actually very low compared to the total number of patients that uh, have been diagnosed as positive for COVID-19, which is about, the last update was 1st of May, yesterday, 17,101. And only 23 in ICU. And uh, just to let you know that Singapore, even though we are a small country, we have about 5.7 million people. Now, a lot, of, a lot of questions have been asked why our number of deaths and the number in the ICU have been quite low. And uh, I think it's because we were prepared. We have a National Center for Infectious Diseases, which has about almost 200 ventilators. And uh, we have about 350 ventilators throughout Singapore. We've been prepared since 
203. So when uh, we started to detect the number of cases, we quickly scaled up from DOSCON yellow to DOSCON orange. And uh, it was like within a month that we scaled up to DOSCON red. But we don't call it DOSCON red because it causes panic. And Singaporeans all rush to the supermarket to buy toilet paper. I don't know how it is in other countries, but you know they like toilet paper too. Uh, so yeah, we we had a big run on toilet paper and uh, rice and noodles. So it was not very good. Uh, so we call it circuit breakers in Singapore. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, I can't see the slide though, but um, I will just. It doesn't seem to come Dr. out very Hartman, well. Can you, can you, Dr. Hartman, can you please mute yourself? yourself? Dr. Hartman, can you see the slide now? No, I can't. Dr. Hartman, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Well, I'll just read it then. Um, I think our measures are all very similar to Dr. Ehud, so I will not run through it. Very, very similar, uh, triage, and uh, all patients will have to fill up a questionnaire. They have to wear a mask, and they're only accompanied by one person. So I think it's quite similar throughout all the other presentations. I think the, it's also similar that we will not, there's actually a distancing practice in my center we have to have at least one meter apart for patients and uh, not more than 10 in the waiting room. Now, I think the only difference is that over here, yes, we have a large population of foreign workers and uh, these foreign workers are housed in very large dormitories. And we had a large cluster of uh, cases that happened with these foreign workers. And so that led to a large spike in cases of almost uh, 8,000 of them being foreign workers uh, because they are housed in dormitories and uh, it spread very quickly among them. But they're all very young, very healthy. And uh, so far, none of the foreign workers have been in the ICU. So I think it teaches us that unfortunately COVID-19 targets mainly the elderly. If you look at the mortality data from China, those above 80 years old is almost 14 to 15 percent. And those between 60 to 69, it is about uh, 8 percent. So can we go to the next slide, please? <coughs> I'm sending I'm you the slides, uh, Gerard. Oh, okay. All right. Through so your, I can just your it. WhatsApp. Okay. Thanks. 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 Okay. Oh, now we we have yeah. So I'm going to run very quickly through this because it's about the same for almost all the other presentations. All non-essential eye consultations have been deferred, um, and uh, my clinic is a vitro retinal clinic. I have an operating theater with uh, two machines, uh, one Alcon Infinity and one Alcon Constellation. We have uh, the full laser equipment, uh, the Alcon Pure Point, and uh, with the indirect laser system, we do a lot of uh, intra uh, On the average, every week, I do about 15 procedures. And um, But because of DOSCON Red, Unfortunately, the number of cases have been reduced very significantly. Now we are only allowed to see emergencies, no non-emergency cases. Uh, patients must fulfill certain criteria, sudden loss of vision, floaters, photopsias, um, you know, the usual uh, retinal uh, symptoms. And uh, all the cataracts, all the gradual blurring of vision, all stable cataracts, unfortunately, the Ministry of Health uh, unlike Israel, we the private clinics and the government clinics and government hospitals are all issued the same directives. So no patients with non-essential uh, conditions are allowed 
to be seen and uh, all stable cataracts have to be postponed. All stable glaucoma patients cannot be seen. Now, as for vitro retinal patients, uh, again, for our staff at the triage, again, I think it's standard. All the patients, all our staff have to wear a mask. Now, if there's a high suspicion of a COVID-19 patient, they have to put on an N95, goggles, and a gown with gloves. But so far, because I'm not in a hospital, I'm in a hotel. My clinic is actually in a hotel. Uh, we do not see any of such patients. They mostly go to the infectious disease center, which is in this hospital called Tan Tok Seng Hospital, next to the infectious disease center. Now, there's a bit of controversy for the local Singaporean ophthalmologists because so far all the recent studies have shown that the, there have only been two studies that showed there was viral uh, RNA material that was picked up in the tear film. But there were several studies that did not. And they suspect that it is because, it's not because it's found in the tear film, but because it either goes up to the nasopharyngeal area and to the nasolacrimal duct. And therefore, when they swap, they pick it up. So some of us still do air puffs, but some of us have switched totally to tonometer. Um, I think this is still subject to uh, be, uh, what I would consider more studies. Now for us vitro-retinal surgeons, in my operating theater, uh, we clean. I have six HEPA filters installed, but I do not have uh, positive pressure ventilation. Uh, but we have six HEPA filters, which more than satisfies our Singapore Ministry of Health requirements. And uh, for our retinal cases, I've done about two vitrectomies uh, recently. Uh, we are told for in the intubation period and for the extubation period, the anesthetist and the circulating staff in the operating theatre have to wear full PPE. But for us eye surgeons, I have to be outside the operating theatre. I do not come into the operating theatre until the full intubation or extubation is uh, completed. Now, as for the draping, uh, it's still the standard draping. We don't do anything different. Now, the deep cleaning is done between cases. So, uh, but now the number of cases are not many, so it doesn't make much of a difference. Now, my centre is approved for insurance and also for our local Singapore, uh, we call it Medisafe, which is a type of a government uh, subsidised scheme. So we are fully equipped. I have three months supply of N95s, three months supplies of surgical gloves, three months supply of gowns. Uh, we are very, very, very well equipped. Uh, but the only thing that uh, probably which we uh, I would say maybe we need to order in the future, um, maybe surgical packs, because right now, uh, unfortunately, all non-essential businesses are not allowed to carry on. And uh, all the big pharma companies like Alcon, uh, they are not able to deliver to the clinic. So we have to stock up on surgical packs because I have a constellation so in my operating theater. Okay, I think that, that's about it. And uh, thanks again for inviting me. Thank you so Thank much, you sir, for the very, 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 very good talk. Uh, we're uh, going to go now to the third, third, module. third module. The third module, the third module, module is... I, I would, uh, in the meanwhile, request Mr. Hudson, Mr. Richard, and Mr. Ehu to just refresh their browsers and re-log it. To log it again? She wants you to refresh your browser. Can you please refresh your browsers? Uh, actually, there's an sure. echo, so if you can just refresh your browsers. So the third module, uh, can I go ahead, Arti? Yeah, I just have the panel on call. Yeah, I have a... Refresh your... Uh, 
Hi, hello everyone. I'll be taking you through the third module, which is surviving the financial storm. Now, we basically all know that COVID virus has been spreading and it's contagious economically as much as it is contagious medically. So here we have three speakers, expert speakers, who are going to tell us how far and how long the damage will last and what we can do to ease the situation. To begin with, we have our first speaker, Dr. Arun Guleni, who is the director of the Guleni Vision Institute from Jacksonville, US. Now, this talk will be followed by the talk by Dr. Gerard Schultz, who is an associate professor from Bloomanda University, California, US, followed by John Pair Rosenbaum, who is a medical director of Thank Vision you. Ost Paris, France, and also a consultant at National Center of Ophthalmology, Paris. Now, these five-minute talks will be followed by a quick five-minute panel discussion by Dr. Uh, Ehud Asia. So we will start with uh, Dr. Arun Guleni. Over to you, sir. We need to share the screen here. Cannot click the share button. You will have to select the screen first. Just select the screen in the center, entire screen, and then share. How's that? Entire screen, you have an option to click on entire screen and then select. You'll have to click on the screen that's showing. The in the center of the screen. There you go. Got it? Yeah. Thank you. Can you see this? I know we can't see this. Can you do that again, please? All right. Entire screen. I can't click the share button here. Can you enable that? Yeah. So after you click on entire screen, you have to click on the window just below it to highlight that screen that you want. Yeah. Can you see it now? We can see your screen. Ready? Yes. Ready. Can you see it? Yes. Can we see it? Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. So. First of all, thank you for having me and uh, seeing all of you here. I can say one thing for sure. The future of ophthalmology is very secure. Uh, great seeing all of you. I know it's morning and evening and everywhere. And uh, what my take in any of these scenarios in life is any difficult situation is a time to get polished uh, and come out as a diamond. So that's my take on any scenario that goes bad as an external environment. I put together a video for you. Uh, as I was instructed. And uh, this video actually shows how the practice, my own practice, which is very unique, is uh, how it was before COVID, what we're going through right now. And then we'll talk about how to revive the patient load. So here we are. So I'll show you here how patients every week in my office leave, doctors from all over the world, teaching all the time, my pleasure, absolutely a pleasure that I miss tremendously with surgeons, my own fashion things that I do in the evenings after surgery, patients coming from all over, I love them and the way I practice one hour at a time, fun things they do with me right out of surgery, breaking glasses out of cataracts or laser techniques or fixing complications, again, teaching part whether it was at home or traveling, and then how my hugs became fist bumps and even more distance hugs before patients fly off. Then home with kids and family, watching movies, took off my suit completely, back to webinars, started cooking to show webinars and teaching premium cataract surgery with omelets, more webinars, did a masquerade worldwide challenge to increase the awareness and help globally by people making masks at home, more webinars. I actually found out gin tonic contains chloroquine, then fashion, I kept on with it, never cheated, wore my trousers during the place and also reflected. Here's a snail I saw a few days ago coming out and then went back in and like a turtle, we need to slowly, this was yesterday, come out back from this lockdown. And I'm sure we will all be back with the bank. 
So in lockdown, what I suggest in a recent interview I gave to Ophthalmology Times, I said, look in. You don't want to go back to something that was maybe wrong or misdirected for such a long time. So it's a great time to look in, get locked into your own self. Is this the practice you want it to be? Is this the dream you had as a doctor? We can always change things. And if you feel everything was in balance, congratulations. A great time to look at the transparency of your practice and how well you run it. Are you properly staffed? Are you struggling? All of these will show you the balance or imbalance in the way you practice. That's a great time to look in. Universal factors that affect patient revival. First of all, what patients will go through on the left side, you see orientation. Nobody knows what to do on the first day we're out, like that turtle struggling to see where to go. And priorities, is it priority about do we still have a job security the patients are gonna look for? Uh, the patients are gonna look for what's our family doing, what happens at schools, colleges. So where's the priority for eye surgery? Necessity, again, what takes higher priority over necessity as a elective. Financial, are financial secure people gonna move into straight uh, elective surgery? Will they take care of other things first? And all these are things that will go on in the patient's world. For us, a maze of new regulations, staff reorientation, new protocols to work with. We had some excellent lectures this morning about various things from sterilizations to taking patient calls, adaptation, maintaining. All this, we still have to maintain our results and reputations would make people come. So we have a tremendous challenge here, but we have to still maintain what we are known for. Now, in my particular practice, very unique to me, practice specific factors because over 80% of my patients are, are referred from out of state, out of country. Mostly they come with their surgeons. So even the travel aspect, I have to study about what to do. Plus on a personal note, I'm feeling obligated. I have about seven, eight patients who stayed back in the US because I did fix their complications of the first eye. And then they thought this would go away in a week. So they stayed back in the US and poor thing, they keep texting me every two weeks, doctor, what's next? So that's the personal practice specific factors that I deal with. Scheduling, I'm not gonna change any scheduling. So this, what my column is, I call stay. Meaning I usually see one patient every 40 minutes. So there's no waiting in my office. It's one patient at a time. So nothing's changing. My, mostly my practice is elective. Uh, over 80% as I said, travel. Um, visiting surgeons also, I feel obligated. A lot of them had planned their travels to come and see surgery. So none of those things I'm changing. What I'm gonna change is, despite having one patient every hour and the way I practice, I will still have to put in extra COVID specific protocols because distancing is already there. How do we operate? That was a great point about covering the microscope here. Sterilization during IOP measurements. We, how we navigate regulations. In my case in particular, how do I understand the inter-country travel now? What do we do with people who are traveling and what do we do with people who are traveling from hotspots? How long do they wait? Do we defer or differentiate between them? How do we do pre and post-op? Most of my post-ops are next day and then the surgeon, whoever has referred them from whichever country takes over. And there's nothing much to do in post-op, but still how do we correspond? Can that doctor see the patient? What's happening in their country? Have they opened their offices? So these are practice specific factors that I'm facing. What have we been doing to maintain all this? A connection and revive the patient volume. Like I said, in my case, it's very personal, a lot of patients on text, but we basically stayed in touch with them. Newsletters, via social media, and it's amazing. This is a great time to see if you're really practicing the way you should, where your patients are all thanking you from social media. They're gratified with their vision. They understand your value. It's very important, great time for transparency and internal uh, to recheck. And then we have triage a number of patients through video conferencing which is in my case, again, I review the notes of their surgeons, look at the patient, discuss plan, topographies, all that, and they are ready. In the same context, we are planning to open uh, this coming week in a very slow pattern, following all the rules, making sure maybe, maybe not, may not see any patient next week. We may start seeing patients later than that, but even other factors that I have to figure out. So action points as far as reviving is to stay in touch with your patients, Make sure your reputation and the work that you work so hard for doesn't go down because of higher regulations. You maintain that. So that is a factor to keep in, in mind. And of course, stay in touch with your staff. Keep encouraging them that this is a mission, not just a job. And they realize that when they miss this. So those are my action points here. And once again, as I said, we do want to come back with a bank to the same fun we used to have uh, with our patients and the privilege of being an eye surgeon. Thank you. So. Hello. 
Yes, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Galani. My pleasure. Thank you so much. We'll uh, revert back to you with questions at the end of the module. Now, next over to Dr. Gerard Schulz for his talk. Well, let's see if I have access. Dr. Schulz, are, are you, have you uh, opened the uh, link on two devices? You'll have to switch one of them off. If you have two devices running, the echo will be there, very close to each other. So you have to switch one of the devices. Yeah. No, I can't help it. Uh, can you switch off your cell phone? That will help. Just your laptop should be good. Saba, can you introduce the next speaker? I'll speak about the speaker. So in the in the meantime, I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Jean Pierre Rosenbaum. And he'll be talking to us about how to support yourself and your family. Over to you, sir, please. Do you can you hear me? So is it okay? Yes, we can hear it's you okay. clear and loud. So, so uh, I'm pleased to be with you. I'm from uh, Paris, France, and uh, thank you for the inv this uh, invitation. It's very pleasant to be uh, to be talking with uh, the whole world now uh, during this uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis. And uh, so I will begin with. Uh, uh, I will be very short. Uh, personally, I wanted to tell you that uh, uh, I never. Uh, I, I, Personally, I was not. I, I didn't worry, and uh, I take care. But uh, I'm not uh, afraid by this crisis. It's terrible. But uh, I do what I have to do. But I not. I don't worry. Uh, I would like to present you my center, which is uh, just near Paris. In Paris. It will be a short video now. Can you please click on screen share? Uh, you want I, well, what you want I do? It is on the left hand side bottom. Ah, screen yes, okay, share. okay, okay. Uh, I, I do it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share, yes. Now you can share your screen. Okay. So can you see it now? Yes, okay. I think you have those uh, slides also. You can play it too. Okay. What Rosenbaum slides you have? Yes, I, I want to say that uh, patient, uh, there is not, not many patient inside the center. First thing, the patient go and wash their hands or they put hydroalcoholic solution on their hands before going to see, going, going and see a secretary. No many people in the waiting rooms. So. so you'll have to press on share screen, which is the uh, third uh, icon on and the bottom left. So we, we, put, we put a barrier, uh, which is a protection. So now I'm going to do my, pres my presentation. Uh, which 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 is uh, supporting uh, our uh, supporting yourself and your family. Can you hear this? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, slide. Yes. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Just a second. Can you see that? Just 
ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ ಆದಿತ್ಯ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಐ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎ ಸ್ಲೈಡ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಯು ಸೀ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಲೈಡ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ನೋ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಯು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಿಕ್ ಆನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಶೇರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಶೇರ್ ಬಟನ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಬಾಟಮ್ ಯೆಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಅ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಯಾ ಯೆಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಕಾಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಇಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಟ್ no i uh, you've not clicked on it i am not able to give you the access can you please click on it again mhm yes and now on the entire screen you have an option to select the screen just select the screen and share aditi can i share his slides yeah you can you can take the screen sharing aditi sir yeah so i i show you your slides yep I see. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh the question for me was uh, how we can support uh, our self and uh, our family. Uh is it possible to go on on the slide please? Yes uh, uh in fact in France uh, the uh, the government French government has uh, taken some uh, uh, crisis uh, dispositions and uh, so uh, the main uh, the main uh, direction was to stop uh, uh, our activity and uh, so it was a problem economic problem and also a problem for the patient so uh, uh, now i'm going to speak about uh, uh, economic uh, financial problem can i uh, yes um, in fact uh, when we uh, at the beginning of the crisis uh, can you can i see the first uh, the first slide please yes thank you uh, no yes the second one second one yes stay stay here yes uh, the government uh, we we could we could obtain uh, easily a state the guaranteed credit which represent represented about 25% of our turnover for for previous year with a period of pay, of grace before repaying loans uh, period gray of grace about one year uh, for the uh, employed stay uh, unemployed staff staff uh, we can uh, stop their work and uh, they are paid by state uh, until return to work they receive about 25 24% of salary uh, of course uh, as in uh, uh, other countries every countries uh, there is there was no cataract surgery even in clinic and even in hospital uh, we uh, the first world was to only consult to 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 keep uh, consulting consulting activity only for emergencies uh, but uh, personally uh, i thought that there is not only emergency there are only essential care and it's very important for example two days ago uh, i've examined a, a young patient 8 years old uh, his parents uh, uh, felt that uh, he had some problem since uh, uh, about one month he had bilateral papillary edema and uh, it was very emergent it's a, a emergency case but it was impossible before uh we have seen him examined him it was impossible to say before if it was uh, emergency or not so uh, uh, i think there are not only emergency uh, cases there are also essential care and uh, now uh, i go on my work and this this has represented about approximately 25% to 35% of my usual turnover next one please Uh, so uh a partial decontainment in France is planned on May 11th so uh we should uh, we should uh, go back to clinic uh at this date uh, but uh, uh, the organization of the beginning of uh, of our surgery is not so easy uh, in fact in cataract surgery we don't need uh, artificial respirator and uh, uh, we have to organize 
people are afraid. All people are afraid, and uh, we have to reorganize to 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 fund to them to reorganize uh, our our uh, 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 surgery uh, program, and uh, we can predict that we will have a progressive increase of surgery activity. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my forecast. I think that in April, uh, uh, my activity will represent about 35% of activity uh, consultation, but no surgery. In May, surgery will represent about 25% and uh, consultation 70%. And uh, in fact, uh, I think that it will be only between September and October that we will recover about 100% uh, uh, of surgery, but the consultation uh, will stay at 90%. Why? because we spend more time uh, between each patient and we can't see, uh, um, not, uh, not, not, uh, we, we can't see uh, so, so the, the same number of patients is the, each day because we have to, to clean uh, every, every part, uh, everything. And uh, each time it takes it take a long time. And also, uh, also yes, we, we, we have to, uh, to spend more time between each consultation. Next, next slide, please. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, COVID will uh, undergo some mark modifi modification in our consult uh, habits. Uh, in France, uh, check limited number of patients. We we have listened it in uh, in the uh, previous uh, conference. Uh, patient has to wash hands uh, and put hydroalcoholic solution. Uh, we have to keep distances between with the medical secretaries, and there is no many people in waiting rooms. Next, please. So, uh, during a ophthalmo exam, uh, we we keep uh, we let the doors open to avoid to touch the door handle. Patient don't put anything on the tables. They keep handles hands on their knees. Uh, we uh, I, I wear a mask FFP2 uh, for ophthalmologist. A patient don't speak when distance is under one meter. Uh, we have protection by barrier plexiglass barrier on the biomicroscope, and we have protection by plexiglass uh, barrier also for secretary and assistant. Next, please. Uh, Many centers in France are closed. Uh, the, 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 the first recommendations was where to see only emergencies, but uh, you, you have listened that uh, for my opinion, I see also, I've examined also essential uh, care. Uh, but now uh, there is an evolution and now uh, when centers are opened, they see emergency and essential cares. Uh, our center uh, remained open during all the crisis. Of course, no surgery. The activity I have represents about 25% uh, at the beginning of the crisis. Now, uh, in the consultation, I, I, I am around 55%. Uh, As I told you, the deconfinement will uh, arrive in May 11th in France. Uh, the, we, I, I uh, go back to refractive surgery on May. Uh, 15th, but we will not have many patients uh, to operate. And cataract surgery uh, will begin on May uh, 21th for myself. Next, please. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, could we could we fix Dr. Schultz's situation? Can we have him back on the screen, please? Arti, uh, he's waiting for. Arti, give him the access. 
Hi, Dr. Schultz. Hi. Hi. Hope okay, everybody good morning. Fine. For the rest of you, it's probably evening or late afternoon. For me, it's the start of a new day. Good. Nice to hear that. Please go ahead. And thank you all for including me in this talk, and I look forward to it. So shall we start the uh, PowerPoint? As you have Dr. Shul's uh, PowerPoint. He's actually doing it. I have it as a backup, but I think he's sharing his screen. Okay, are we on the screen? Because if we are, I'm going to tell you how we work the COVID-19 virus in my practice. And I want to give special acknowledgments to one of the residents of Bascom Palmer, who had a fantastic grand rounds on the COVID virus last week. What we want to do is pull out our Superboy to kick that virus away. We have an in-family Superboy, Jay, and he's going to be the future of controlling and kicking away all the illnesses in the future. So we'll start with of course, in our field, the red eye and what this means. I was asked to talk about the staff, human resources, and what it is meaningful for the staff. So these are the questions that my staff have. Will I contract the virus from a patient? The schools are closed. How will I care for my young children if I have to work in your office? How can I homeschool my older children? And if they do stay home, if I don't work, how do I get the money for my expenses? Will I be able to keep my health care? Will I get my job back? And if I am at the office, will my hours and salary be reduced? Of course, this differs from every type of organization, and I'll tell you a few of them now. So let's have some answers. Will I contract the virus from a patient? Well, this was very well covered by the previous speakers. Let me point out that the ophthalmologist and the staff are at big risk for contracting the virus because we work so close to the patient for extended periods. And previous speakers talked about the gloves and the masks and the N95, but these only give limited protection. The virus can be transferred to the eye and then to the respiratory system, and I'll show it to you. The transfer can be from rubbing the eye, meaning we are rubbing our eyes. For the staff that wears contact lenses, that means they're touching their eye. Or they can have direct contamination from the patient if the patient coughs and it, uh, the aerosol goes into the eye. Therefore, protective goggles are definitely recommended to reduce the risk. And I mean goggles that really surround the eye, not just ordinary eyeglasses. So let's go into recent publications. This was a 29-year-old ICU nurse that developed a conjunctivitis and the next day had fever and breathing difficulties. Conjunctival swabs were positive. And this was in Ocular Surface uh, News. It's coming out in July, but it was online. And we can see that she has the ground glass configurations in her lungs. The eye cleared, but still, by day 18, she still had the infection in her lungs. Here's another publication. This is in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. 30-year-old male who developed conjunctivitis. This occurred about eight days after he had other systemic involvements. The conjunctiva was positive for the virus. And finally, a very recent publication. This is a member of the National Panel on Pneumonia. And he reported that he was infected uh, while uh, in Wuhan seeing a patient. He wore the mask, but did not wear anything to protect the eyes. Several days before the onset of his pneumonia, he complained of redness of the eyes. So unprotected exposure of the eyes can lead to the virus. So 
Talking about Wuhan, review of the literature showed that reports from China were coming out very early, and the fact that they hit the journals shows that it was well known even in January. And as uh, other speakers have mentioned, it's a shame that our country, the United States, didn't jump on it like many other countries did to prevent the widespread spread of this virus. The warning signs were out there, and it was even in our medical journals. Let's go back to the concerns of our staff. If I do work, will my hours and salaries be reduced? Well, in the United States, supposedly, we're getting what we call the payroll protection plan, meaning the government will give us enough money based upon last year's payroll to continue on for a couple of months. Those members of my staff who do have to stay home because of their children, they will get unemployment insurance augmented by the federal government at $600 a month or a week to continue on, meaning some of my staff members who stay at home have the potential of making more money by not working than if they're at the office. However, as Governor Cuomo of New York said, trying to get money from the federal government is like trying to rob a bank. You can see that my application for the payroll protection plan has been approved. I have yet to see the money. So I want to thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, for that very, very informative talk. Can you hear us? I hope I'm back. Yeah, I think. I don't know if I'm back. Talking about the virus in the eye, for those of you know how the virus latches onto the body, it's through the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, the ACE2. And the virus has spikes that latch onto it. We know that the, gut, the lungs have a lot of the ACE2 areas. However, when you get sick, emphysema, asthma, the field increases, the conjunctiva has it. And in previous SARS studies, it shows that the retina, the choroid, they have it also, the conjunctiva has it. And in the report from Baskin Palmer, there have been corneal melts, perforations of ulcers from the current SARS COVID-19. Thank you. As far as antivirals working, um, we're using the antivirals, gancyclovir, et cetera, for patients that do have an ocular manifestation of the COVID-19. Whether that is really helping or whether the patient is getting better on their own, we don't know. What we do look forward to are the remdesivir, et cetera, that type of medication. Hopefully they work and newer ones that are being formulated. Thank you for having me participate.
Yeah, hi. Am I audible? Sorry, my internet got disconnected. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next module. Uh, the fourth module is uh, a topic uh, about maintaining your assets. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Peter Down from the United States here, who is a consultant for Market Scope uh, in the United States. He'll be taking over a topic called the market scenario. Uh, we'll be taking questions for the third module in the game. And with him, we have Dr. Shmuel from Israel, who will be talking about ophthalmologist perspective. So we have Mr. Peter Down. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, well, let's... Uh... Start, let's start and look at uh, what happened in... Yeah, we can see us there. China first. So eye hospitals in China were closed for three to eight weeks, depending upon the location. Uh, some, but not all, provided emergency care, which was typically retinal detachment, acute angle, closure glaucoma, and trauma. When they reopened, uh, many found they had a backlog of chemical trauma cases from uh, people disinfecting their homes and splashing disinfectant in their eyes and then not being able to get out or not being able to travel after that and waking. Um, no walk-ins for eye care. All uh, appointments were done online or by telephone and then checked at the entrance. As several people mentioned, you know, for a cataract capacity is reduced for fewer patients anyways. Um, and a big emphasis on getting uh, refractive surgery back. All the private hospitals emphasized refractive surgery a lot. Um, in the U.S., we uh, surveyed... Uh, Inventory surgery centers on March 24th. What time do you um, need me to question mark? Which was just after uh, several of the state closure orders came down. Uh, and you see that 39% closed, 56% were open for elective surgeries only. In terms of uh, clinics, 16% uh, were not seeing any patients at all. Uh, and 80% had reduced hours, were mainly seeing only emergent conditions or following up on patients um, who had had surgery before the stay in place orders came out or were chronic patients, um, such as uh, those getting IVT injections. So cataract went down to almost zero. Uh, retina, most practices will continue to IVT injections, but about 30% of patients declined to come in um, because patients do have uh, a fear of getting the disease. If you look at uh, the patient volume in the U.S., uh, and uh, C. Charles already mentioned this, by April 4th, it was uh, had dropped down to only 20% of patients uh, in ophthalmology practices. Uh, and it was around March 20th when um, most of the major stay-at-home orders started in the U.S., although, again, there's no national response. It varies state by state. But even before that, patients out of fear had uh, started not coming in. And that issue of overcoming patient fear will be an issue when uh, clinics reopen and start up again. Uh, so when you look at India, we did a prediction for India, uh, two different models for the crisis. One is kind of a short term, that is practices closed for two months or less uh, and uh, they ramp up, and they reopen, ramp up and achieve uh, uh, kind of the same level of the previous year. Um, in about four months. And even that, you see, on, on a year-to-year -year basis, we see we estimate a decline in cataracts, IOLs of 27%, uh, refractive procedures 28 to 29%, so on down the line, as you can see. If there is a second wave of the pandemic later in the year, uh, or and the first wave continues a long time, I, I realize things are already in India. So if there's a second wave, then you expect a much more severe crisis. Uh, our estimate for the market in India, uh, these are in millions of US dollars. This is with the declines 
revenue in the last slide, you see about $263 million per capita. These are manufacturer's revenues. Uh, revenue $281 million uh, for a total market of about $1.3 billion for manufacturers in India. So uh, with that uh, snapshot, I'll let you move on to the next presenter. Super. Uh, can we have questions for uh, the two modules together? Dr. Cyber? I think you can put Dr. Cyber and Dr. Levitowski. I think she's exited the session. She, I don't see her in the list. Uh, she'd be as Dr. Arun, I think. Yeah, I've checked it. I don't see her. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting. Now we move on to our next module and the next speaker. And we're going to invite Dr. Shmol. Is he there? No, he, he's not logged in. Anymore. Okay, so then we will move on to the next module. And we have two very eminent speakers in this module. One needs no introduction and is Dr. Kathleen McCabe from Sarasota. The other one is Dr. Barbara Perovani from Italy, from Lombardy. So I'll check if we could get Mr. Matt Young to coordinate the session along with Dr. Arun Guliani for Dr. Kathleen and Dr. Barbara Perovani. Thank you very much. Dr. Barbara, please. Sorry, Dr. Kathleen first. Hi. Nella, mi posso curare una più lunga, per favore, che devo rimanere If you can give me the permission to cancel yeah. or to share my... Thank you. So let's see. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna just go over a little bit of what our experience is here in Florida in the USA. And you know, I think everything that can be said about our leadership has been said already, uh, especially by Steve Charles. So yes, we are winning. We are getting sick of winning. I can see how much we're winning here with uh, 1.1 million cases and over 66,000 deaths. And in particular in Florida, we have, you know, 34,000, almost 35,000 cases. This is only current, I think, until the 30th of April. And our particular situation right in my local community is that we have a case fatality rate that's somewhere around 10% even. Despite all that, in Florida, we are opening up uh, for phase one, as we term it here, reopening where we uh, can start doing elective surgery on May 4th, so next Monday. Uh, we are in our facility restricting the volume so that we can maintain social distancing and all of the things have been so eloquently described as uh, methods of keeping people safe. We don't have a negative pressure OR and nor do we have HEPA filters in the OR. So I've been listening uh, intently to some of that discussion. We are in our facility limiting the patient's health as a, an age. So patients who are over 75 or who have significant comorbidities, especially the ones that we know have a decreasing survival rate with COVID, we are limiting at this time. Uh, of course, any large gatherings in Florida in general are still restricted and uh, masks are recommended, but I can tell you having gone out to the grocery store not long ago, they're really not being used widely at all. Um, which is you know very concerning, especially with our elderly population here. So I think we're going to see you know more to come that's not going to look very pretty. But what we know is that old days are gone. Uh, this is a family picture, and my little granddaughter, who's a baby there, is no longer a granddaughter or no longer a baby. She's still my granddaughter. She's a toddler, and you know we have to move forward. We're not going to be moving back. And I think. Uh, when I listen to people talking about what's going on, not our, not in our discussions today, but it's all about getting back to normal that looks something like our previous normal. And we all know that's not going to happen. So we have to decide what is the pathway forward and how do we 
you know, move forward with safety, knowing that we can't forever stay quarantined. And so our my top concern, especially as a chief medical officer for a pretty large practice, is safety for the patients, for the staff, for the doctors. And we need to do that while still making some level of efficiency, probably never what we were before, but still efficiency using other technologies and techniques that allow for safety. And that's gonna change our workflow in many of the ways that people have already discussed, both in the clinic and in the ASC. And it's going to not look like what it did in the past. And I have you know, a great desire to provide both local and international outreach and mission work, and that's gonna change as well. Already our yearly mission this year was canceled. I have another mission that I'm hoping to go on later in the year and we'll see. Uh, I have a, a high suspicion that's not gonna happen either. But what we do need to do is what everybody has also mentioned, and that's look for the silver lining. What has this allowed us to discover about ourselves, our communities, our practice, what our priorities are, and how how are we going to you know reevaluate that? And does it really take a crisis to make us look at those things uh, in the future? So things we're doing for safety, a lot of what other people are doing, uh, we're checking temperatures and symptoms and regulating who comes in and trying to minimize the contact of our patients in our office. So right now in the US, we don't have rapid or accurate COVID-19 testing. It would be wonderful if we did. A lot of our phase one and phase two reopening strategies are around that, but it's impractical and it's not, not available, at least not in my community. There are some institutions that are doing it effectively like Bascom Palmer is and others, uh, but not so easy if you're in private practice, really not easy in Sarasota for some reason. So what we're doing instead is all of the things we know are helpful. They're not absolutes. We're trying to maintain social distancing with our patients, having them wait outside, having them do as much of their uh, pre-op uh, intake and also their preclinical intake uh, from their car or virtually um, before they come in and only having the patient or maybe one essential caregiver come into the building itself. Waiting rooms are not for waiting anymore. They're just staging to get to the next stage and hopefully with just one or two patients in them. And, uh, and then sending them back out potentially to their car to wait, to decompress our waiting areas as well. And we've really invested a lot of time in telemedicine. Uh, it's a way of us connecting with our patients. In fact, our practice as a whole, our larger practice, just did their 1,000 uh, telehealth uh, interaction and, and call with patients. And some of our doctors have really embraced that more than others, like Dr. Han on the bottom right there. Um, it does, is a little bit limited in what you can do, but you can certainly effectively do a lot of the consultation with the patient, education of the patient, um, and explaining what you're going to do. And in the setting of both the physician and the patient, both uh, having their face covered in the future. This may be the only time your patient ever sees you and you ever see your patient uh, is if you do it over a digital platform where you can actually see each other's faces. So I think that that's gonna be a big change and it's something that's here to stay and we're just trying to figure out how do we do that where it's valuable information, more home testing, remote testing, even visual field testing that can be done in the future. 4C home, uh, we'll have a home monitoring OCT for the macula. These are kinds of technologies that will help us to have more meaningful data to look at. And I think that there are things that we're going to continue to need to integrate into our practices in the future. So efficiency. So how do you do all these things and be efficient? Uh, there's a really wonderful series that was put on by ASCRS, uh, especially with the help of Baskin Palmer, looking at how telemedicine can help with some of those things. These hybrid visits we're really looking at where we have a patient come in and do all of the technological part of their exam. Maybe they get their OCTs done, they get a pressure check, they get some other things, photographs even, and then a lot of the consultation is done either to educate the patient prior to coming in, even having them maybe to check certain parameters from home. And then a lot of the discussion with the provider is done not face-to-face -face where you don't wanna speak a lot in the same proximity, but by telehealth afterwards. So we're really looking at that. And again, I already mentioned some of the IOP monitoring, home OCT things that are coming in the future. What about bilateral sequential same-day cataract surgery? It's been something discussed in the US. There are some institutions like Kaiser that have done it effectively. Um, I think this is gonna be a bigger and bigger conversation in the future, maybe something that will help going forward to minimize again, the amount of time that our patients are in contact with facilities and other patients. 
And we did, somebody already mentioned, the drive through testing. That's something we're looking at, especially initially for post-op day one testing, IOP testing. Um, but also a new a glaucoma patient put on a new um, pressure-lowering drug really just needs to be seen for their IOP. Maybe we'll do that from their vehicle rather than have them come in. So we are looking at those uh, strategies as well. And certainly if they're picking up product or contact lenses or, or glasses, having that done uh, where it's brought out to the patient rather than the patient coming in, uh, maybe with an order of fries like somebody mentioned earlier, but uh, certainly the, those strategies are important. So our workflow is different. You know, Now we're gonna have patients log in, give us as much of the data as they can, maybe speaking with one of the technicians prior to their visit, come in, like I said, just do what needs to be done face-to-face -face and only those essential items, and then a lot of the discussion done remotely. Um, we're gonna maybe use our, our physician extenders, our optometrists, and even maybe a nurse practitioner to do some of this uh, explanation and the more extended outreach. Uh, and we really, and personally, I think these long acting interventions are gonna take on a bigger importance. So we recently uh, had FDA approval of uh, bromonidine, the um, long acting Durarista. Uh, that I think is a tool that will be helpful, it has a very long acting effect on IOP without patient compliance or all the things that we worry about with coverage. Um, depot steroids, either for uveitis or in the post um, intersegment surgery setting, like Dextenza, Dexa-Q, Ozerdex, all of these things. And mix, you know, these are other things that require maybe less monitoring in face to face, more remote monitoring, and less compliance with the patient. So, uh, again, combining surgical procedures, mix with cataract surgery, bilateral. Um, laser interventions, same day cataract surgery. I think these are all things minimizing the patient's contact uh, in the future. And then again, talking about outreach, boy, our our um, staff even and our and people in the community are suffering financially. Uh, there's certainly a greater de or, or need as far as access to care, especially in the U.S. where we don't have universal coverage. And so this is going to be a big deal. Nursing homes and assisted living because of the living environment are more uh, significantly hit and some of these remote monitoring might be more important in those areas. And international with travel restrictions and a lack of support from some of the companies, that's a, a big concern as well. So hopefully in the future when we have vaccines and maybe antibody testing that's meaningful and understood and understandable, um, that will open up some of this again in the future. Can you see me? So silver linings, well, I think, you know, especially in the U.S., um, the standing of medicine and doctors kind of had taken a big dive in the public conscience, can, uh, and boy, that's changed a lot over the last... Now it's better. Uh, I can years. hear the speaker, but I cannot... Uh... These are now uh, heroes in the community, so I think that's been a good thing. We all collectively had a global moment to breathe, to rest, to pause, to reevaluate. See you know, we all understand just how intimately connected we are as a global community. We are all fighting the same battle. We're all, you know, trying to figure out how to move forward. And I think that's connected us a lot. And actually having access to technology like this uh, has connected us in a way that we don't always uh, know was available, even though it was there before. And like many of us have mentioned already, we've had time to learn a new skill, to spend time with our family, to reevaluate our priorities. And, and I think that hopefully in the future, it's not gonna require a crisis for us to understand how important that is in our lives. So stay safe, stay well, we'll get through this together. This is my two boys and I, after uh, there was a, a typhoon in, um, we were in Melbourne and and uh, and actually we were in Australia going diving and we were smiling at the end of it. So it's all good. We'll get through this together. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this. And I have really uh, valued understanding what's going on globally as we fight this crisis together. So thanks again. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for helping us with, uh, with an eye opener talk and uh, understanding our priorities. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Lisa Abiza from the United States of America, Dr. Reena from India, and Mr. Matt Young uh, from Vietnam. And uh, over to uh, Dr. Barbara from Italy for her talk on optimal risk perspective and the new normal. Hello? 
How are you? I'm very happy to be with you. And uh, as the previous speaker said, it's very important to share globally the experience. I will move for the sake of time to share my screen. Entire screen. Now. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. All right. So what about the new normal in ophthalmology in COVID time? Well, everything has been said already, but I will go through quickly the current status of COVID in Italy. Still, we have lots of cases, but the good news is that the healed number is growing up. Please look at the map. The red uh, areas are in North Italy and my clinic is right there. So you know how to filter everything I've been living through and everything I will say. But I think it's important to know who is actually dying for COVID. It's been 28,000 so far in North Italy and the mean age is 80 years old. But uh, unlike uh, somewhere else, uh, uh, male are dying uh, much more than female, 63% were male, and 60% had at least three comorbidities. So it's not for young people, it's not for healthy patients. Italy is locked down since early March. We had a very fast and uh, significant transmission uh, just after China, we think for the economical relationship with the China and there was misrecognition of the symptoms. This was a mistake because we thought it was a flu. And uh, especially in North Italy, in Lombardy, many people were hospitalized in the, at the end of uh, February. And so it was very fast to spread and uh, many healthcare uh, providers actually died as well. Still, we have no ceremonies, no future. It's very sad to see the tracks carrying the dead bodies, uh, but that's the way it is. So these are the curves that describe what's happened in Italy. It's good to see that the positive curve is now flattened. We have a peak and the yield is growing. And this is the best news. The, good, the new cases are going down. What about ophthalmologists? As everywhere, the elective procedure have been postponed, just emergency cases offered only in certain institutions. As previously said, for Israel, private centers have been mostly closed, but no clear rule were available for private centers. But we are doctors and we need to treat our patient, and it's very difficult to balance between controlling pandemia and not treating the one in needs for eye treatment. In particular, in my practice, shut down on March 2nd to allow isolation of staff and patient. And patient themselves were self-limiting, calling to cancel the appointment. I went to the clinic alone and for free for emergency cases because I offered my cellular phone and email to all my patients through newsletters and messages. So lots of volunteer work with the ophthalmology patient and with the COVID call center. So the new normal in the private ophthalmology clinic starts now. We have to treat, I think, everybody in need like before and not just emergency. We have new protocols for consultations and uh, a new setup in the clinic. And telling the truth, most of my patients are just telling me we would rather be dead than blind, uh, as opposed to what I've heard before. So I think there's a very important role for the secretary to filter the virtually healthy and negative patient and avoid patient with symptoms and patient in contact with positive or suspect positive. The second selection is on site upon arrival with the questionnaire, temperature is measured, gloves and masks are offered. And I think you've seen this everywhere. So as Dr. Gulani was saying, I used to see three patients per hour. Now I see two patients per hour, no, never overlapping in the waiting rooms. We ask the patient to come alone if possible and uh, to enter alone in the consultation and diagnostic room. The reception area is isolating from the waiting room. The waiting rooms are very clean 
and nude, no magazines, no candies, nothing unnecessary, and distances are respected. Disinfection of everything comprised of chairs, doors, handles, not only instrumentation after every patient. There are much more physical barriers between doctors and patients and staff and patients. And of course, the uniforms and masks. Uh, so let me go back. Still, we don't use puff and uh, air tonometry, only single use tonometers. So what about the surgical area? Well, surgery preparation was carefully managed before COVID and it's the same now, with the exception that the patient is wearing a mask even entering the OR. The OR is sanitized after every patient complies the mask. Uh, I am... Uh, I hear some more of Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I have always done subtenum anesthesia for years with the sedation, except for children and mentally impaired. So this is this has not changed. As far as bilateral, I had just started bilateral cataract, but I had a bilateral endocolitis plus bilateral ear being done. And so I just quit bilateral. I think it is safe enough. Uh, it's rare to have problems, but when they happen, it's too much. We are not required to test for COVID, and we have lack of availability of COVID tests, and serology tests are not validated yet, so we are not doing We work on selection. This has changed as well. We used to be lots of people in the OR, and now it's basically just me and the patient with the anesthesiologist and scrub nurse and guests will be able to connect online. So online work, of course, always in touch with patient is very important. I already had started pay video consultation for long distance patient in the pre-COVID area. The patient is has to perform a consultation with the local doctor. So I think the connection with local doctors and the expert is very important and it works for the management decision uh, Mm, making and uh, the consultation can be recorded with a written report so under a legal point of view i think we are safe finance is very sad and painful because as private professional we have no support so no work no money and uh, this is different for doctors working in governmental hospital at least in italy government supported at least for three months the staff with the partial salary so they could keep their position. Bank support with a question mark. We ask for loan payments to be on hold, but the requests to the bank were so many that they cannot keep up with the request. And we are still waiting for the government to know if we have to pay taxes, when, how much, we don't know. Online education works perfectly. Look at this meeting with so many people connected. I think it's a great option. It's less expensive for the organizer, less tiring for the speakers. They uh, remain recorded for the audience. It's easy to remain on time as a schedule. And I think telemedicine can help the training. I was asked to tell you about my Corona time. Besides working, for education, talks, study, data review, which I do and I absolutely love. I, of course, rediscovered my hobbies, gardening, bonsai, painting, and uh, mostly cooking. I'm celebrating 53 years of age and 25 years of marriage. And um, yeah, it's important to remember that this is not the first time every 100 years we go through an epidemic so i hope the next generation will be more ready than us for the next epidemic in 100 years but my view of the future is very positive the number of patients per day is reduced but i think it's true for most of you i am traveling less i am working more Therefore, the number of patients per month should be almost the same. If we guarantee our patient a treatment in a clean and risk-free area, I think they will have less fear, especially outside the hospital. So I can foresee a good role for the private centers. Staff is reduced per shift according to the needs. The clinic is cleaner, smells good all the time. I'm less stressed and working with higher quality per patient, so I will not be able to go back to the old way. 
I think we should adapt and adopt new solution. And I thought about the three S, saving, selection, and software. Saving because we will be more careful, just keep quality, but not wasting. Selection of case instrument techniques and hygiene measures and software because technology will help smart connection both in care and education. So if health and money last, this will be a very important time in our life and sign a beginning of a new era. I would like to greet you with this last photographs and video that I just take. It's the sunrise just yesterday. And I hope with this to leave you with hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, to introducing us to the new normal. I would uh, ask uh, Dr. Rina to introduce Dr. Lisa Abiza. And also, we have uh, time for two questions, so any two questions for the speakers. And namaste to all of you. And uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Um, welcome, Dr. Lisa. Dr. Lisa is not only my mentor, but a very renowned uh, ophthalmologist. He's been a great teacher and uh, always been there to help young uh, ophthalmologists. And I welcome you. And uh, any any suggestions or any questions uh, that you would like to say, uh, Linda, a few words about the new norm that we would be facing post COVID? Yes, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to join. You hear me all right? Yes. Um, yeah, it's good. Um, I, it, this has been a wonderful conference um, in that I think we all have to rethink what the future will bring. A couple of things that have perhaps not been brought up um, is about research, about transplantation. Uh, are we going to handle tissue differently? Uh, I know that uh, I'm an adjunct professor at Moran and they are continuing their vivarium and just their very critical uh, studies that were ongoing and otherwise uh, have uh, pretty much a stop. Uh, how that's going to affect things, uh, particularly in the USA with uh, FDA requirements, it's been really interesting to see how many kind of false starts we've had in terms of what medications might be effective, are they effective, what can we use, you know, without uh, anything close to the, the type of uh, clinical trial, you know, of course, there's been no time for such things, you know, of what we've uh, anticipated and expected in the past. Uh, I think those are things to be uh, contended with. I do think that uh, there'll be some advantages as well. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we now actually have accessible virtual visual fields where uh, for a, uh, a belonging fee per month, uh, uh, there will be uh, devices and things that we can give to our patients and uh, collect. I think things have to change you know, dramatically with how CMS in the US and other governmental agencies uh, agree to uh, payment and such. Uh, but there will be more and more telemedicine going on, uh, more and more uh, activity with um, essentially studies that can be done at home. Kathy mentioned uh, for C, which has been available for a really long time and, mm -hmm. and picks up uh, second eye in particular uh, age-related macular degenerative neovascularization way earlier than waiting for the patient to notice and report. And, and that's been so minimally used, you know. I, I, we personally, um, my husband and I have, uh, and, and congratulations to all because, you know, I think one thing that really supports us are our personal relationships as well as our professional relationships. And I feel very blessed. Uh, my husband and I uh, just celebrated our 44th anniversary, uh, but uh, our, our home uh, may be uh, organized a little differently. Certainly in this period of time, very early on, we, we even got a, an oxygen concentrator, a cardioverter in our remote farm uh, uh, place. And um, uh, we're, we're learning you know, so much about what it means to be self-sufficient. I think we also have to think about our particular environment uh, and our communities. and. Uh, there's got to be more realization that that in a situation where uh, so many people don't have food security or water security or 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 the the, the essential securities of life uh, that we continue to be able to reach out and improve those 
uh, those conditions. And I, I particularly uh, uh, respect those of you, uh, the safeties who've managed this, you know, who have seen a million patients for free. And uh, uh, those of us who continue to try to look into making our communities stronger and individuals more secure so that our, our whole way of life can be more secure. I'm personally, in addition to being worried about the pandemic, the viral aspect and disease, I'm very worried about the, the political chaos that may follow, the changes in, in uh, the ascendancy of democracy, uh, the uh, increase in populism and, and potentially even fascism and uh, what our children and grandchildren will face, uh, most particularly with climate change. No one's mentioned the one silver lining of this whole thing, and that is that you know Mother Earth got a small respite from from all of our uh, use of fossil fuels and such. So uh, those are some of my observations. Uh, they needn't take any more time. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, not only to participate but uh, making me aware to uh, benefit from this entire presentation. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Congratulations on your anniversary. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Well, you know all about that. <laughs> um, next, any questions? Anybody have further comments? I, I don't really. Um, think uh, there's much more that I, I have to author, offer other than uh, to count our blessings daily, to try not to fall into the, uh, the, the trap of, of depression and hopelessness, which I think is sadly uh, becoming more prominent all over the world and figuring out uh, how we can uh, pull together and get through this. Yeah, that, I think that is one of the tragedies of isolation is that it does have a, a terrible effect on, as somebody mentioned, you know, suicide and depression and domestic violence. And, you know, when some of the, when we start opening up the economy, but schools are not open, what happens with those kids that don't have anybody to care for them or not to, you know, help organize their studies and things like that when they still have to be home. So I think there's, there's a huge impact that goes beyond just the fact, which is serious enough, that people are critically ill with the disease. I would like to say that uh, this uh, 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 this infection is going to last for a long time and probably it will not be the last one. So we will just have to be able to adapt and learn how to live and do anything, not just emergency, not just uh, what's really necessary because even ophthalmology elective cases become emergent at a certain point and they need to be treated. So we need just to change style and be able to do everything and be covered under the legal point of view and know that we are doing the right thing. I would like to know your point of view. Well, uh, you know, I, I, are you speaking uh, specifically to me, I guess? Uh, I don't know that I, you know, I don't have uh, the wisdom to know exactly how this is going to work, but we certainly need to get back to work. And I'm very concerned about medical training and, you know, the fact uh, that, I mean, experiential intuition is something that's gained over time of huge patient contact and, you know, uh, uh, We've seen that that our learning curves for surgical skills, you know, continue to increase with greater volume and really don't level off. And I even wonder, you know, for people who've been out, I know I, the longest I was ever out of surgery was with each of my four children, you know, three three months, and and that was, you know, a challenge to to even come back. That first case, you know, felt rusty. And I I really hope that uh, everybody will be able to just uh, uh, come back with the same skill level and uh, more, and that we'll be able to help our trainees. I, I, I fear that that things will become all the more cookbook, you know, algorithms and uh, and uh, uh, cookbook uh, learning has become 
uh, very prominent, much more so, I think, in this generation than the last. And decisions are made by the numbers. And I worry a little bit about that as well. Uh, although that may be where we're headed, and particularly with AI uh, uh, being able to collect data and analyze it more accurately, apparently than the human mind, you know, we'll have we'll have that advantage, and perhaps that will overcome some of the disadvantage of not having such a high volume of contact uh, with patients and uh, the panoply of diseases and conditions that help us to recognize problems and treat them appropriately. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, next, continuing with the new normal, uh, we have a very dynamic speaker, uh, Mr. Matt Young from Vietnam, who uh, is not only the founder of Media Mice, he's also the founder of the Pie Magazine and the Cake Magazine. And he's here to talk about the role of media and webinars in the new normal. Thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I'm just going to take a, a few minutes uh, to give an overview of my story. Um, let me share the slides first. He's breathing rapidly. I hope he didn't have the disease. I bet he did. Still working on that. Okay. Yeah, got it. And I think we can take a couple of questions uh, after one more talk after this. And can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. I think I just lost that. Just a moment. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Right. So, uh, you know, actually, I was in the middle of a, uh, a grand European, African and Indian media tour um, to expose more doctors and industry about PI and Cake magazine. Uh, PI stands for Posterior Segment Innovation and Enlightenment, and Cake stands for Cataract Anterior Segment Kudos and Enlightenment. We call ourselves the world's first funky ophthalmology ma magazines, but we're based out of Asia Pacific, uh, moving from east to west. When I came back from Europe, uh, landed in Da Nang, which is my home here, and um, I was immediately quarantined because I had uh, the country of Germany on my uh, customs form. Um, Vietnam was very aggressive to quarantine at that time, and I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't know I was COVID-19 positive until about three or four days into quarantine. Um, it was interesting because my colleague, Robert, uh, who I was with, decided to go back to the U.S. at that same time. Uh, he was my traveling and business companion. And um, he thought the U.S. would be a lot safer to handle the matter. And so he went back there. Um, fortunately, I came to Vietnam because I did not infect uh, my wife and kids or the community. I was immediately quarantined. And um, after three days, which starting to show some symptoms of breathlessness, um, back pain, leg pain, and uh, no fever though. That was one thing um, that, uh, although I guess in 98, 99% of the cases have fever, I, I didn't. Um, yeah. Um, what can I say about that time? Well, I had a lot of anxiety, I suppose, around the situation, but, um, at the same time, I felt, you know, I had read a book uh, not too long ago um, called uh, Dark Nights of the Soul. And, you know, we, we talk about going inward at this time, but in a way, my journey was both inward and dark. Um, but it was also transformative because as I was there in bed, um, wondering, you know, whether I was going to survive this, I, I felt a sense of urgency, I guess, to get back to work, um, to dive in deeper to who I was as a person and also as a leader. And, um, and so a, a transition happened when I was there in the hospital. I became not Matt, the CEO anymore, but Matt, the journalist that was trained uh, at 
the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. And, you know, I, I suddenly realized that what I was going through in terms of our ophthalmology community and the friendships that I have near and dear, I needed to get that story out. Um, and so I spent some time writing and reflecting, and it was kind of a soulful story how I was also feeling a bit guilty of uh, potentially infecting those colleagues and associates uh, back in Europe. But anyway, uh, managed to contact them, and they were all all right. Um, and I, I don't know of anybody at this time that I actually did uh, infect, so that seems to have gone all right. Um, Getting back to the professional aspect of things, I'm just going to advance here. Um, so basically these were my, you know, my, my stats at the time and I put this up on LinkedIn and apparently people said, no, you're still doing all right, don't worry about it. Um, but I started to write my story and I ended up posting it on our Pi Magazine site and on LinkedIn and it was, you know, I received something like 22,000 views on LinkedIn, as well as um, 200 or so comments. And it, it, it changed my perspective a lot um, because I realized at that time that my friendships in industry were, were not fake friendships. They were actually real friendships. Uh, people reached out to, to give their love and support at a time when I was ill. And um, I felt like from that moment, forward, you know, I didn't really feel like, I, I didn't have to feel like I was going off and just meeting some business associates that, that you all became dear friends in my life. So Pie and Cake Magazine, um, we've been around since 2017 for Pie and Cake since 2019, um, but I'm going to share another screen here. Um, what I, I realized quite quickly was that we needed to move from ebooks, which we had been publishing, to um, essentially almost like a crisis mode where we needed to start covering things in depth. So very quickly, we transitioned our website to start co covering the uh, COVID and uh, COVID situation as it relates to ophthalmology. And this is where I think it starts to get interesting for physicians and doctors, because for example, um, one of the last days that I was in quarantine, I ended up interviewing uh, Ken Fong, who's the Malaysian Society of Ophthalmology president. And, um, you know, they were, they were starting to uh, pack my suitcases and get me out of there, but I still wanted to keep talking to Ken. And um, so, I, I, you know, I filmed this at the time through, I guess it was Zoom or, or Skype. And it was kind of choppy. I'll just play a little portion here for you. It was nothing really professional. I think the videos won't play so well. It okay, is. that's fine. Sure. Um, but an anyway, um, you know, what, what became abundantly clear is that all of the news media in our industry was suddenly moving from very high production value to fairly low production value um, because webinars, you know, have choppy internet connection and, you know, all kinds of issues. But nonetheless, it's important to get the story out. So I think that what this means is that for you ophthalmologists out there who are trying to get your stories across, you know, start taking those um, selfie videos, start um, recording your webinars and submitting them, if interesting, to uh, ophthalmology media companies. Because now that we're doing more coverage um, daily and, and so, you know, we're using this, all of this in terms of multimedia. We're using dynamic pictures, stories. There's Dr. Setti's wife, uh, Rena Setti, who was also talking about this fascinating, um, fascinating issue of uh, the impact of uh, hydroxychloroquine on the retina, which could be significant. Um, also, I would like to note that in this day and age, you know, I do find that personalizing stories, you know, ophthalmologists, of course, are, are trained to convey matters clinically, but personalizing a story whenever you can with all kinds of pictures, even off the wall pictures, you know, this was my haul from uh, Amsterdam, I kind of made a hospital mini bar, um, you know, pictures from when I was sort of in captivity, so to speak. But you ophthalmologists are out there on the front lines, 
and things are happening to you, things are changing your lives, um, consider not only sharing the clinical aspect of what's going on, but also the personal aspect, because this is what this is what people want to to know at this time. You know, when everybody's in isolation at home, people are yet connecting in new ways, and they want to know more about you. And we're already seeing, um, you know, people's homes and things like that in in quarantine. This is my kitchen right here. Um, so, you know, I've turned this into a mini studio tonight. Other things that are interesting to note. Um, I think it's important to note that right now, even if, you know, you've got something going on as far as a 2.2 millimeter incision, that's really important. Um, somehow relate that back to this story that we're in, which is the pandemic. Um, you know, many people I've talked to have said this is bigger than 9-11. I think that's fairly obvious. But this is the story of our lives. And um, as a journalist, it's important for me to cover it, but it's also important for uh, our sources to know that for stories to have meaning in the, this day and age, to relate it back to COVID means actually people um, will read that a lot more than, than other types of stories. And you might say, well, you know, that's too bad. People are still focusing on the negative, but um, I think just, again, in terms of raising awareness, raising awareness about you're doing in the, what you're doing in the clinic, um, it's critical to provide that within the context of the time that we are now in. Um, meetings also are uh, a fraction of what they used to be. So, for example, right now we're coming up on... Um, we're coming up right now on ASCRS, and then there will be the WOC. But because these places no longer have a monopoly on the actual physical space, um, you know, they've essentially become, in a way, media. You know, they, they will be a place that, that ophthalmologists go to tell stories. Um, but it really is, is going to be on the power of those societies to organize those webinars and then use their databases to get that information out. In a way, they've become more like media companies, but yet they're still using older ways, older models of uh, getting awareness about that out. So I would say um, more than ever, engage your media, ophthalm your ophthalmology media uh, partners around the world, whether it's us, whether it's other companies in the field, because um, we are adept at, at telling stories in, in a certain manner. We can get to the essence of the truth behind what's going on. And um, we do look forward to being your partners for getting those important stories out there still in, in this day and age, and especially because of this day and age. Um, I'd like to, to note also in terms of Asia Pacific, um, although these are global publications that we run, I think it's important to note that this is the first time that there are regular news publications in Asia Pacific. You know, before, as I mentioned, we were a quarterly magazine. Um, our competitors were also quarterly out here. We've now moved into uh, weekly and daily coverage. And so from the perspective of Asia Pacific, trying to reach out to the world, making it relevant, um, you have us as a resource and we're always willing to listen to, to what you have to say. So in closing, um, our satellite office here in, in Vietnam, we welcome what you have to say. Um, we're in a, a little, little part of the world, just Da Nang and, and Singapore as well. But I think from here, um, we can get the word out, and uh, we're looking forward to helping you to tell your story around the world and, and seeing you at the next ASCRS. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, before we take you to questions, uh, which is going to be headed by Dr. Saiba and Dr. Rina, uh, we have a sponsor talk uh, that I'll be... Uh, Can you please click on stop sharing? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'll be just uh, talking about something very important uh, in this time, where touching your face has become uh, a big problem. So what do we do? Uh, this is a, a presentation not only for patients, uh, but also for ophthalmologists, which is uh, we wear masks and sometimes it gets itchy or we have a habit of touching our face. Uh, 
how do we sanitize our face so tea tree oil is something that we uh, the the way farm company in india has uh, suggested we use so we know uh, already by various talks that covid 19 is a very deadly virus and it uh, causes respiratory illness that has been named covid 19 and uh, affects and kills um uh, and causes a lot of mortality in uh, low immune people symptoms are cough and can lead to uh, pneumonia like how dr shoot has shown in this slide uh, affects many asymptomatic people like how match showed his own uh, personal uh, uh, experience with the virus that he was asymptomatic till he realized uh, and he was quarantined in uh, vietnam um transmission is primarily person to person and if people touch an object surface uh, where the virus is present it goes from them to their uh, when they touch their mouth or nose it goes inside their nasal pharyngeal uh, space aerosol infection is um, the commonest way of it spread and relevance to eyes it is suggested that exposure of unprotected uh, eyes to 2019 covid 19 uh causes acute respiratory ill infection and regular cleaning through disinfectant wipes is recommended so eye and face hygiene care uh, by cleaning face and eyelids at regular intervals is recommended especially with the tea tree oil based formulas uh because tea tree oil has antibacterial antiviral and also some antifungal activity has been shown by various articles before and uh, tea tree oil uh, is open uh, for all uh that's the uh, the chemical uh, composition and uh, there's an article uh, which uh, has shown that uh, tea tree oil may act against enveloped and non enveloped viruses both uh it also has a significant effect against influenza virus and uh, we already know that uh, it has a lot of effect on demodex infestation on a hair follicles like shown by this video i don't know if this is good and that's the demodex and it has a lot of effect on this it's also an anti inflammatory agent and it's safe and it must leave on product formulations uh, we have it available in india uh, i'm sure they're available uh, all globally as well and i think this is a very nice uh, and innovative solution uh, to clean our faces and keep uh, viruses as uh, away from us as much as possible and this can be easily considered so now uh, I think uh, we can have some questions uh, before we close. We are an hour late, so uh, with some quick questions with Dr. Reena and Dr. Uh, Saiba. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can we have all all the uh, speakers? We can have a screenshot as well, and a vote of thanks by Dr. Reena before we start. So can we have everybody raise a thumb? Be nice to keep that. Thank you. I'm just adding few more people. Just give me a moment. Yeah, please do. Easy. I was told we've crossed uh, close to 800 uh, live audience at the moment, which is quite a feat. And we thank uh, each one of you to make making your contribution, making this possible. And all. Okay, thumbs up, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can we put Dr. Reena and Dr. Saiba, and sure. maybe take me and a uh, few more people <laughs> out? Dr. Bilani is joining us soon, and Dr. Bilani is also. Yeah. So, Dr. Reena, you want to start some questions? Yeah. Um... I like to. I think I had uh, Dr. Lisa. You wanted to say something. Wanted to ask something. I'm giving her the access. Uh, could you please put all the faculty again for the screenshot? Dr. Gulyani is not there. Dr. Asia, Dr. Uh, Steve Ashraf. They all want to come in. Hey, Dr. Hudson. All this faculty, please put Dr. them Schultz. for the picture first. Dr. Rosenbaum. Dr. Rosenbaum. We have nine nations. Participating is United Nations and WHO together. Uh, oh, the picture. Yeah. Dr. Saiba, are you optimistic for the future? 
This has been, this has been brought to the most elegant faculty the webinars I've ever seen. The best yes. women in town. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, do you think, you, you, uh, in fact, we compare this uh, uh, COVID crisis uh, like uh, the crisis in 1918, but it was not the same po population at this time because in, 19, uh, in 19, 8, 1919, 1918, it was a patient uh, about uh, 30 years old. And uh, the difference is uh, that now, uh, uh, people live longer and uh, uh, less, uh, the immunitary system is uh, less uh, strong. And uh, in the COVID, uh, COVID crisis, uh, this uh, affection uh, is touching more uh, elder patients. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm I personally, uh, I'm not so afraid by a second uh, period of cri second crisis coming. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, of course, we we will have probably a second uh, second wave. But uh, I think uh, personally, it will not so important that uh, uh, we uh, we we think. Uh, so we have to take care, of course. Uh, personally, uh, uh, at the, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, uh, I go on to work. You know, uh, my age is not the best age to go on to work. But I go on to work and uh, I, uh, I see the patients uh, very carefully. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, one month and a half after I'm here and uh, uh, everything is OK. So because I take care and uh, I, I did what, what, I, what I had to do as a doctor, as a medical doctor, because uh, our work is uh, to, to see the patient. And I always thought that it was not a good solution to, uh, for the doctor to stay, uh, uh, to stay uh, uh, even even for ophthalmologist uh, to to be to, to close everything and uh, we have uh, uh, essential care treatment to give to, the, to our patients and uh, so uh, now I can I can tell you that uh, uh, in my consultation I am about uh, uh, sixty percent of consultations of course I don't operate yet I will operate in fifteen days but uh, uh, I'm the same point of view of uh, my uh, Italian uh, colleague. Uh, who is uh, uh, even in uh, in uh, in uh, very very hard difficulties? Uh, she 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 keep uh, she, she stay optimistic and uh, and uh, uh, every everybody uh, want to fight uh, against this uh, COVID and uh, I think it's our work it's our job like uh, soldiers. <laughs> So I think um, I think like uh, being uh, good uh, doctors and health workers, we have to stay positive because if we don't do that, uh, we're not going to really help the society because this is our moment, our uh, virtue to actually help whoever we can. So I think mm -hmm. Dr. Lisa, you wanted to point out something. Well, uh, it's it's not huge in the big picture, but you know we we now have so many virtual ways of training uh, with. Um, you know, uh, I, with eyes, uh, uh, simulated uh, eyes for uh, practicing surgery that we use in skills transfer labs at Ascris uh, with um, uh, various simulators and things. And so, you know, to keep people from getting rusty, it amazes me that all the surgery centers all across America have been just closed, you know, whereas whereas they could be so useful in, in so many ways. Uh, so I don't know, maybe maybe this will help us to to think forward a little bit about about ways that, you know, don't involve uh, a direct contact and uh, to take advantage of all the modalities we have available to us to be the best that we can be and help our patients in those ways. Thank you very much. I request Arjun to bring all the faculty as well as all the people on the screen, 14 of us, for a screenshot. And uh, all this will be available tomorrow on YouTube after editing. And uh, we hope that you tell your folks to access YouTube. And it's been Thank great you. having having all of you. And we'll take the questions after the screenshot if you still want. We still have about 500 faculty logged on. In, in the meantime, can we have a vote of thanks? So by Dr. Lina. The, the screen shot. Oh, everybody was screen, including Mr. Paramahans. Dr. Glani was saying something. I'm very grateful to Mr. Paramahans for his support. The doctor, we couldn't have done this. Thank you very much. I had much. some questions that are coming through private. Uh, uh, 
um, texting. What is it going on on the side? Too much in the center. Hello. No, I am sorry. I really have to you for another conference. I thought yeah. I was finished. I cannot stay any longer. I'm so sorry. So what did you do? Thank you so much. Just one, one minute. Thank you so much for all of you. We will take your screenshot. Just one minute. Gracias. Gracias. One minute. One minute. Dr. Lisa has come all the way from the farm. I'll get Amir in the picture too. Come here. <laughs> Let me say, yeah, yeah. and congratulations for your uh, yeah. fourth wedding anniversary. Everybody, give a big hand to Lisa and Amir for joining us. Why? Doctor Gulani had a question. Actually, I had. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hear you. I got some private text messages from a uh, number of people about. Uh, when I talk positive about everything about the COVID, and I truly believe that I love uh, what you said from Italy right there, Dr. Uh, Lisa, amazing positive things to think. As I said, lock down, but lock in, find out what you are doing. Here's my most important parting statement, since I don't think we have more time enough to leave to. Don't forget who we are. Yeah, absolutely. Most brilliant people. That's why in college, among thousands, you became a doctor. Remember how your parents celebrated that? Among doctors, you were so brilliant, you became an eye surgeon. Stop looking at external forces to save you. Look inside, right here. You are the ones who are going to save everybody. So please, look outside. Yes, follow those rules and all that stuff. But don't forget who you are, the most powerful person who can help others. That's yeah. my body statement. That. It's positive. Just be amazing, on track. You've got an amazing, privileged job to do here. It's amazing. Thank and you. all of you who are locked into Bali to enjoy the lockdown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank can you we, so can much, can we, everybody. Can Thank we you so much. Everybody pose with yeah, we, we say namaste, and I think we should all be very thankful to be safe. And we're going to make people also say um, on a very positive note, we should take everything ahead of us. And, and thank you very you much. Peter Downs, Peter Downs, Dr. Nakamura, Namaste, Amir, Namaste. The next webinar will be after two months, and you'll all be back with a new topic. We'll let you know the <laughs> <months. Two months laughs> <you'll be> <laughs> Can we have the word of thanks now, please, Dr. Rina? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here with us. Uh, like they say, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I'm sure in this lockdown period, these minds which are so active scientific and out there to help others are not going to be uh, wasted we are all going to come up with such new innovations and uh, uh, keeping in mind of all these lovely ideas which everything is one and we all are affected by the same problem the situation is the same in most of the countries so we are going to have a good uh, uh, innovation of handling this problem. Thank you so much for being with us, and I'm sure we're going to meet once again on a much happier note as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. See yourself on YouTube tomorrow. Lovely seeing you all. Thank bye. you so much. Thank you. All right, let's see here. Thank you, folks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Very good conference. Very and good. It was was enjoyable. And I yeah. might say that I was very impressed when I talked to Iran earlier that with Delhi having 20 million people, unfortunately, they did have deaths, but only 95. Well, in my community of about 200,000, we've had 25. So your care is much better than ours. And we wish that Dr. Hudson's football team wins against Argentina. <laughs> yeah, Brazil is a lot better. So Brazil will win against. I, I, I would like to like, uh, 
raise three cheers towards our technical team and Mr. Siddharth who helped us get all together here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aarti. Thank you. 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 Thank you, uh, Dr. Ashna. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shul. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. It was a real, really a very good idea. And uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to do it together. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Asya. And Dr. Shmo. Uh, Dr. Asya asked the question. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Asya. Bye. Bye. You want to see Dr. Asti and Dr. Guy? Yay! <laughs> Next year in India. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye.